I would like to call this meeting to order. Will you all, I'm sorry, council meeting for October 5th, 2023. I would like to call this meeting to order. Will you all please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you all so much. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Reed. Here. Vice Mayor Woods. Here, ma'am. Councilmember Tinsley. Here. Councilmember Primoroso. Here. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Thank you so much, Patty. Do we have any additions, deletions, or modifications this evening to our no, agenda? Lovely. We're going to move right along to announcements and presentations. Our first presentation is a tourism update. We're going to have Discover Palm Beaches come for a presentation about their summer fall campaign. So we're going to ask Sergio Piedra, who's the Director of, Director of Community Engagement and Advocacy for Discover Palm Beach, come on up to the podium. Hello. Hi there. Mayor Reed, uh, council members, um, uh, city staff and all. Uh, we're here for a update. Uh, we're in a good news business. This is the tourism update. And um, I think you're gonna be really pleasantly surprised some of the things we're gonna present to you this evening. Again, I'm Sergio Piedra, Director of Community Engagement and Advocacy for Discover. And our second presenter tonight is gonna be Milton Seguera, our president and CEO, his first full week on the job. So. Um, so, investing in Palm Beach Gardens, I'm going to kind of take you through a quick trip. The most important thing um, you're going to see is that we are investing in Palm Beach Gardens. When it comes to our website, you can find Palm Beach Gardens through, found throughout it. Um, not just the hotels, and not just the golf classic, uh, but also an entire page dedicated to the city. And also on social media. Uh, social media is one of the most important things we use to market uh, the Palm Beaches and Palm Beach Gardens, and you'll see yourself on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, across our different channels. And one of our favorites is Mayor Reed, who was, uh, you know, nice enough to give us one of the best videos we probably have ever used uh, to promote the Palm Beaches. Um, uh, I'm sure that we can always, if you haven't seen the video, by all means see it. So, uh, but it was a big hit this summer during our Love the Palm Beaches campaign. Thank you again, Mayor. So. Uh, you can also find gardens uh, throughout our visitor's guide. Uh, there's also a page dedicated to the city um, and also highlighting some of the restaurants um, and the great culinary scene here in gardens. And we'll be happy to uh, be a sponsor this year for the uh, tree lighting. We have not done that before, um, so we are happy to be on board for that. And when the golf tournament comes back around the classic, um, as it's known right now in this moment, again, we'll be sponsors for that and promoting that is one of the best events we have in the Palm Beaches. So, but now um, I'd like to bring Milton on uh, for some of the more important facts and figures and things about our campaigns. Thank you, Sergio. Um, Madam Mayor, Council, Public here, thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to be here and share with you more information about this beautiful city. Um, I've been here a year, a week in my job. I live nearby, but we spend so much time here in Palm Beach Gardens. This is a beautiful place. And last week I, was, I had the opportunity to attend the BDB uh, update. And I have to congratulate this council and, and, and all the investors and stakeholders for the phenomenal development this city will see in the next two to five years. That's phenomenal. And that's why I want to share with you before I share with you where are we going to go. What's happening here in terms of uh, numbers? First, we have a in-house system in which we generate most of our stats and how we measure success in certain KPIs regarding the tourism company. We have more than 20 um, sources in different categories. So we have uh, a robust way of finding this type of numbers. And the good thing is that all of them when we talk about Palm Beach Gardens, we're seeing a phenomenal uh, number. For example, in terms of total uh, visitation, 844,000 visitors, of which a little bit more than half a million 
are outside the Palm Beach County. And within the Palm Beach County, you see how popular this city is with over 336 uh, visitors. And you have the breakdown and being Port St. Lucie, uh, Fort Pierce, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, you see the breakdown. So it's, we're talking about almost a million visitors that, that's coming. And this is not including international visitors uh, to the city of, of, of Palm Beach Gardens. Also, and this is key in terms of the hotel industry, the performance, um, it's very viable. It's a solid um, industry. As you can see, the total number of room nights sold, rooms occupied in our county, was in excess of 4.7 million room nights, of which in the North County, we're talking about 707,000, and here in the city of Palm Beach Gardens, 463,000. And when you see the, that in revenue, uh, total revenue in this industry, in room revenue is over $1.2 billion. Bottom line here in, in the city is in excess of $100 million, 106 to be precise. And when you see the particular indicators in terms of occupancy, uh, average daily rate, which is the ADR, and the ref part, which is very important for investors and development, that's the revenue per available room. That is a key uh, performance indicators um, to see and, and tell you exactly how well the industry is moving. So as you can see, the indicators for Palm Beach Gardens, 70% occupancy, that's 12% better than last year, $200 average rate, which is very good, and $140 uh, uh, ref bar. So it's viable to develop hotel business in the city of Palm Beach Gardens. Um, in addition to that, this is a snapshot of the zip codes 33410 and 33418, total sales of $388 million, divided in over $200 million in food and beverage restaurants. That's a very important component for the city. Um, $89 million in hotel revenue. And in recreation, very important, 96, almost $96 million. So that's divided between 174 restaurants, 10 hotels, 183 alternative accommodations, and some other attractions. So as you can see, very vibrant, um, and, and uh, visitors are coming. But the most important thing is what the residents of your city are thinking about tourism. And we compare 2022 with 2023. And the good news is that the residents here in Palm Beach Garden, they do like tourism. And here are the indicators, tourism create um, create shopping restaurants and entertainment opportunities, 92%. That's really high. That's really good. Um, it's much, much better than the national average. Um, tourism creates many well-paying jobs, 77% versus 63 last year. Uh, tourism enhances the quality of public services for residents. That's 74. Pretty much three of every four of your residents are thinking that tourism enhances the quality of services. And the last one, which is so important, tourism enhances the quality of life of your resident. That's 80%, and that is solid. Normally in the nation, that number is like 60, 64%. So as you can see, um, a city that has been developed and is moving in the right direction, and tourism is part of this growth that you're seeing. What is in, what's next? A uh, master plan. Even though we're seeing great numbers across the county, the fact of the matter, Council, is that we don't have a master plan in place. An industry that has grown tremendously in the last 10, 15 years, so we don't have a master plan in place. So the county is putting together an effort. As a matter of fact, um, an RFP was released, and we're in the second stage. Soon we'll be seeing the proposals from the uh, potential consultants to really create a master plan. Questions like, do we need to double the number of tourism to, to be called successful destination? Uh, should we spread tourism to underserved communities? Is that model sustainable? I mean, do we need to consider some other type of measures and performance indicators to say that the tourism is successful and, and, and really impacting the quality of life and the quality of place of the city or the county? Different things that we need to really think about if we want to move forward in the next 10 to 20 years, one of the most important things is to develop a good visitor's management policy in many places called over tourism. How are we going to deal with that? So those are type of conversations that we want to have with cities, with the county, with the residents to make sure we have that input in this master plan uh, for the destination. Also, uh, we're launching a new campaign 
living here in, in Palm Beach County, it's like a collection of experiences, different experiences from north to south, from the beach to the river to the lake. So that type of things will be reflected in our new campaign, which is called the Palm Beaches Collection. It could be created different type of collections between cities, North County, South County. So we have a lot of ideas with the new, this new approach to the marketplace. Also, um, the fact of the matter is that we are a welcoming uh, destination, period. Uh, we have the number of repeat visitors that we have, Hispanic, black, um, 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 LGBTQ, um, white, you name it, they, they like to come here. And we wanna make sure that we have a message in place that says that the Palm Beaches welcomes everyone. And we're doing very specific um, efforts to make sure that message goes across uh, all the markets that we serve right now. And finally, all of that needs to be done, helping the frontline employees to make sure they can provide the, the right type of services. So this year, we are engaging with a company which is called, um, uh, we'll do the Certified Tourism Ambassador Program, CTA, to provide that type of certification to all the frontline employees at hotels, restaurants, attractions, so that anyone that engages, engage with visitors or residents to make sure they can provide the right type of information. So as you can see, it's um, a lot of things, but the fact of the matter is that we wanted to finish with this photo Maybe you know where is this. This is the, today's the double tree, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, times fly, so, and this is a reflection of how um, the progress that we have seen in this city and then across the county as well. Uh, by the Mayor, that's a report. If there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you, questions. Milton. I'm gonna speak on behalf of myself and Bert because we both grew up here, and, and I, when, we, when we grew up, that was the only hotel in town unless you went to Singer Island, and that was the colonnades where MacArthur was anyway, right? So um, this is extraordinary to see that picture. It's, it's definitely um, very nostalgic. And I wanna say it was such a pleasure to ride with both of you, but you and Sergio on the first Brightline Absolutely ride the major. other day. It was amazing. So thank you for all you're doing for our thank community. Thank you very much. Thank Any you, Council. Everybody? Good evening. No? Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Next, we have a recognition of the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce for being awarded three top honors from the Florida Association of Chamber Professionals. So we're going to ask Noel Martinez, who is president and CEO of the Palm Beach North Chamber, to join me at the podium. And if all of our council could join us too, please. different. I've never been over on this side <laughs> as, a, as a council member. Um, so I just wanted to update just a little bit, fill everybody in and, as to why we're standing up here today. So the Palm Beach North Chamber won three statewide awards this year. So Certified Plus Chamber of Commerce, Chamber of the Year, and Executive of the Year. And, and personally, I was lucky enough to be asked to write one of the letters of recommendation. So I would just, if you guys would grace me for about just two minutes, if I could read a few of the sentences that I wrote about Noel, and you'll understand why he was given this award. So it was a long letter. I'll make it short. My hope is that in this communication, I will highlight Noel's unparalleled ability to inspire, guide, engage, reward, and connect, acting as a catalyst and assuring the best outcome for our community, our chairs, and our volunteers. He's indefatigable, sincerely warm, and above all, walks the walk, serving as a beacon of intelligence and guidance for our entire community. Noel is much more than a remarkable executive. He's a visionary leader, a committed, um, excuse me, committed to corporate social responsibility, and encourages the best of all of us who engage in the success and quality of life for our residents of the 10 large and varied municipalities that the chamber represents. And then a lot more paragraphs, and then in finale, we are a team, he says. When he speaks about the chamber, he has never said I, me, or myself, which is the hallmark of the best kind of leader. We wholeheartedly recommend Noel for his exceptional ability to recruit, motivate, and reward committee volunteers, 
His leadership has undoubtedly been instrumental in fostering a dedicated and results-driven committee culture within the chamber. So it goes on and on. But I just wanted to give everyone a little idea of what you mean to us. Um, we've all been part of the chamber, most of us for decades. So we've uh, chaired committees for you, volunteered on committees, handed out t-shirts or water at, at triathlons, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. And our amazing clerk, Patty, has set this gorgeous plaque up for you, and I'm going to read that as well. The City of Palm Beach Gardens, City Council, City Manager, and staff are proud to recognize and congratulate Noel Martinez, President and CEO of the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce, for your achievements in earning the Certified Plus Chamber of Commerce Chamber of the Year and Executive Year. These top three awards are a testament of your outstanding leadership, dedication, and commitment to our community. It is our pleasure to pre present this to you today on the fifth day of October 2023 on behalf of our City Council, our City Manager, and all of our staff. Thank you for all you do for our community. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations again, Noel. All right, we are going to move along to comments from the public. We do have a few cards on items that are not on the agenda. When I call up your name, if you could kindly come up and you'll be stating your name and you'll have three minutes to speak. And <clears throat> if you guys would indulge me for just one more moment, some of the folks that have come here tonight to speak maybe haven't been to our council meetings before. We were so glad to see so many seats and chairs again since COVID. So I just have a few little updates that we wanted to share on behalf of our council. So this is a public hearing where there will be presentations, testimony, questions, answers, and discussion. Above all, mutual respect and consideration is expected. This meeting is important to all of us and will be conducted with decorum. So to ensure that we meet these expectations, here are some ground rules. This chamber functions most effectively and efficiently by following the rules of decorum with respect and a professional tone and conduct. If you plan to comment publicly, ensure that you have been sworn in, stating your full name and address for the record, and make your comments within the allotted time, which here is three minutes. And just so you know, three minutes is about 150 words. So if you have any comments ready to go, you may want to do a little quick count. So if you could address your comments to the presiding officer and not to individual members of our council staff or other members of the public, we appreciate that. We ask you to be courteous, respectful, and allow others to complete their comments without interruption, without noises, without comments, and without gestures. Please do not clap. Please do not cajole or ridicule any speaker, whether they are council, staff, or a representation from the public. So please utilize common courtesy any disruptive actions and orderly conduct of the meeting out of accordance with our basic principles of decorum may be ruled out of order and will result in being removed from the proceedings. We cultivate and protect an atmosphere where the member of, members of our council and the members of the public can attend to the municipal business that we all care about so much, openly, fairly, and respectfully with full participation. So with that, we'll go to the first card, and that is Ms. Terry Bates. Name and address, please, when you have a moment. And you can tell us the name of your dog. Words away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to address the council. My name is Terry Bates. I've been a resident here in Palm Beach Gardens for the last 25 years. I grew up in this area, as the mayor did. My address is 11110 Oakway Circle. And I'm here today to speak about one of the issues that's certainly going to be a part of the tourism of our city in the future, and that's the big new SoFi complex that's been um, under construction at the Palm Beach Gardens State Campus. And unfortunately, one of the th impacts is going to be on our neighboring communities, Sun Terrace, the Oaks, Monet Oaks um, in our area. And certainly we support tourism, and that's tourism that's been done with the oversight authority and review by the city of Palm Beach Gardens. Unfortunately, in this case, the city has had no say-so at all in the siting or development of this facility. And as a resident who's going to have to live with the traffic, the noise, the impact, you have to ask, how does that happen? How do you get this massive facility with no city oversight? And further, what does a for-profit private enterprise have to do with the academic institution at Palm Beach State College? We've learned the college is exempt from local um, oversight, from your ordinances, from your zoning, and even from your review. And you have to ask, how is that the college being a good neighbor to the city and to our residents? We've always enjoyed living next to the college. We consider it an asset. But in this case, it seems to have gotten off target. Under the terms of the lease, there's no limit on the number of events, or the hours of operation of this facility. It's going to serve alcohol, food service. I don't know if there's going to be tailgating in the parking lots at the college. They plan a large marquee message board sign on PGA Boulevard. And from what we hear in the news media, they're going to accommodate 1,500 to 2,000 patrons at this event. There's no traffic plan approved. Right now, their plan is to exit traffic at Campus Drive at the traffic circle. Really? How is that supposed to work in our neighborhoods? Personally, I think it's a cool concept. I think the golf competition is, is very, very interesting. But I think it's unconscionable that this college has moved forward with this without coordination, without input in regard to the city of Palm Beach Gardens. That's not what good neighbors do. I recognize that by law, the city can't do anything to stop or change this project. They are going full steam ahead with construction. They're ready to start operations in January. And at this point, the best we can do is help to mitigate the impact of the project on traffic, on our neighborhoods, and on our community. And I appreciate that the city has done its review. I know you've sent a very lengthy letter of, of issues and concerns and questions to the college. I don't believe that you've gotten a response back to, the, to that yet. In particular, the city asked the questions that we asked. What's the co compatibility with the adjacent neighborhoods? So we appreciate you looking out for our residents. And although you have no say-so over the development, I think now you're in the position, no pun intended, you're, you're, you're batting clean up to try and do the best you can with the facility that's moving forward. So thank you very much for the opportunities to address you. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Um, city Manager, is there any, anything we should follow up on that? I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, we've tried, uh, we've given input, um, and we continue to be ignored. So. I, I can't, say, like I say, I couldn't say it any better myself. We've given it our best effort, uh, and we've gone through several administrators now, and we get no cooperation. All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Bates. We'll certainly be keeping an eye on it. Um, moving along, we have David, I believe it's Parks. Does that look like Parks to you? P-A-R-K-S. If you could come on up. You'll have three minutes at the podium, sir. David Parks, 11648 FICA Street. I'm here to make an inquiry about the charter process and make two charter requests. But for the thousands that have joined our community since 2018, some background from the last charter review. Voters on the 28th of August, 2018, weighed in and elected to retain a five-year charter review, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And outside of cleaning up an outdated charter that was not in compliance with Florida state statutes, in what our contracted committee moderator called the fastest charter review he'd seen in 40 years of public life, a huge expense was devoted to the charter review to implement a private citizen's revenge agenda for being ousted by term limits, with lots of taxpayer loot spent on lawsuits to close the deal. My interests were speaking out at the time, as they are tonight, 
was to fight to preserve the rights within the charter that give voice to the public. I come forward tonight with two requests to preserve the public votes. The necessary ordinances could be written by the city attorney without all the kabuki theater and expense of five years ago. I request charter ballot question one to change section 4-2 to expand the council from five to seven. The profile of this community has changed since 1977. By any metric, there have been stunning changes since 2018. So question one would be yes, no. If yes, then 4-3 would expand the quorum to five. I request charter ballot question number two, which again deals with the charter section 4-2 to change the method of election. I would request replacing the current group arrangement and replace it with a council that is elected from defined boundaries that the council members actually live in. In 2017, group voting had four members of this council living within the same gated community as the private citizen who was orchestrating the last charter process. Group elections in the gardens made that possible. It's a yes, no vote. If yes, a staff or court approved pre-designed process would be triggered to define those boundaries using rigorous DEI analytics of the city's new demographics. The targeted implementation date would be March 2025. Current council would retain an assigned district until their term expire. Perhaps one of you elected under our current group process who lives in a gated community could explain why you would care if Cabana Colony was the subject of future eminent domain scheme. You know, something that may be already in the works under our intergovernmental processes. In closing, ask, is the real reason our candidates are running unopposed in recent elections because we have a shortage of politically ambitious citizens or a potential candidate studied the calculus of our current political arrangement? We should answer those two questions on the March ballot by following the same timeline the city demonstrated it was more than capable of in 2018. Thank you for your consideration. All right, thank you very much, sir. Next, we have Chip R-A-T-A-H, Rath, I believe. If you could pass it to our city clerk over here, please. Excuse me, can you share those? I beg your pardon? If you could give us your presentation, sir. The presentation is based on the literature I just gave you. Okay, our clerk is going to have to review that and, and we will receive it. But we do, we have about 30 more cards here tonight, I'm sorry. Okay. My name's Chip Rath. Um, I live at 22 Marina Gardens. Uh, I live, <clears throat> if you look back here at this picture to the left, that is exactly where I live. That my, that's my home right in the middle. I'm here to speak against the uh, Port 32 uh, re redevelopment. I'm sorry, please, sir. Can you yeah. please uh, speak in the microphone? Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm here. You, okay, so on, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. So on your card, uh, we, we have a little area that was checked off for, um, par, uh, you, it was listed as a traffic study. If you'd like, we'll be having, um, if you okay. don't mind waiting a moment we'll be able to put you in the pile with everybody else that have given their cards to talk about this one specific issue. Is Certainly. that be okay? Sure. All right, thank if you, you so much. If you could distribute that, that'd be Understood, helpful. I appreciate that. So we just had you in the wrong pile here. We'll let you go first when it comes time. How about that? All right, so that is it for items that are not on the agenda. So next we're going to move on to our city manager report. Ron, do you have a report this evening? Thank you. Uh, just a couple of items. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to bring uh, David uh, Reyes to the uh, podium, to our Director of Emergency Management, to give you a wrap-up of our activities with our sister city, uh, Crystal River. Uh, David and his crew and the employees have done, of the city of Palm Beach Gardens, have done a fantastic job of rendering assistance uh, to Crystal River and their employees. David? Great job. Uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, David Reyes, Community Services Administrator, Director of Emergency Management. And I just have a brief update on the last trip that we did, Operation Sister City, to work with uh, Crystal River. As you know, in addition to sending resources to help the city with uh, stormwater and park cleanup, 
uh, one of the employees uh, was affected by the storm. In fact, this employee had about three feet of water inside his home, so he lost everything. So we activated our Operation Sister City program, and I'm happy to report that we raised in about a week close to $3,000, which you can see right here in front of you. Christ Fellowship, uh, again, a great partner, always there for us, donated $1,000. Um, all the city employees, our city council, uh, together uh, purchased a whole list of items on Amazon for a total of close to $1,500. And our golf course uh, charity uh, fund donated another 500. So combined is about $3,000 that we were able to bring in to assist uh, this employee at Crystal River. It's amazing. And then the special part of this whole program was our Riverside kids. If you could see in the picture uh, on top, um, our Riverside kids wrote some amazing notes for him. And that was the special part and that we put inside the care box. And, um, and that made it really special for him. Uh, all the items were delivered last Friday, and um, <clears throat> he received everything last Friday. And in addition to it, I just want to make um, one special thanks to two employees, Daniel Wittick and Jennifer Nelly. Uh, unfortunately, they're not here tonight because they're in a football game with their kid, but um, they volunteered. They actually went out there and delivered all these items on their own time to bring all this to the employee on time. So it was a really a special moment. Um, everybody in the city out there couldn't stop crying because it was a really special moment. So I want to thank the council again for your support with all of our program, including this one. And uh, it was a great success. And we're done with our mission uh, for this year, hopefully. So I'll answer any questions. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's extraordinary. Thanks. One other. One other item, if I may, I sent you a, um, a memorandum. At the last council meeting, you asked me to look into a process in which we could donate to schools uh, the sum of $5,000 uh, and how we could come up with a program to be able to expedite that. I sent you a uh, memorandum which basically outlines the process that we would uh, at the council's request at any particular meeting you would want, we would actually pull names out of a hat. Um, that way we have uh, nine local uh, public schools. Uh, and each, um, each name that we would pull out would be associated with a year, starting with this year, for a $5,000 donation, provided the funds are available in the budget. Uh, so that's very uh, simply put, uh, an easy way, an objective way uh, to be able to provide the $5,000 per year for, for each of the nine schools over nine years. So if you're good with that, um, we could just let me know when you want it done. We will bring it to the council. You can do it here at the council meeting. We would uh, announce that to the schools and invite them to attend to watch the drawing if they chose. But um, that's the process we came up with, and um, I'll wait your direction. I actually think that's a fabulous idea um, and uh, a fun idea, too, for the schools. I just have one request if the council would um, consider the following year after the first, whoever wins the first draw, if we could remove the name of that one for oh, the absolutely. second year. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. no one can, um, it's no, there's no do-overs. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, if they have Bert's luck, they'd no, win the same drawing every what we, year. We will, what we will do, I'm sorry to interrupt, what we would do is the night that we pull the names, we'll pull all of them in a row. So hypothetically, let's just say Palm Beach Gardens comes out of the hat first, they get 2023. If Dwyer comes out of the hat second, yeah. they get 2024. So we'll pull all of them Perfect. ready to go. So nobody gets awesome. $5,000 a year straight for nine years. Awesome. It'll be done in one meeting. One Perfect. Meeting. Could we... is, is there any time of year that we should do this that's helpful for the school? Probably as soon as possible. I think the next meeting. Beginning of the year? Okay. All right. Yeah. I think... I, if... I know at the end, of the, the end of the school year, they have a lot of events as well. So... You know that well keep in mind uh, council routinely has over the years uh, made contributions to um, 
Project graduation. Project, Project graduation. Right. That was forestalled during the COVID era, but we're back in business now, so the money's still there for project graduation. Perfect. All right, whatever you want to do is fine. On May we please do it at our next council meeting, and we'll just get it rolling? We'll, we'll have it prepared. We'll notify the schools, and uh, we'll be ready in November 2? November 2. Perfect. Okay. That's extraordinary. That's all I have. Thank you so much, and thank you, Council, for your support with that um, consideration. All right, so we're going to move on to our consent agenda. Thank you so much, Ron. Has anyone have anything they want to pull off of the consent today? No? All right, so we have nothing being pulled. May I get a motion, please, and a second to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion passes unanimously. We're going to move along to our public hearings, starting with Ordinance 12, 2023. These are our public um, hearings, non-quasi-judicial. And if the clerk could please read the title. Let the quasi-judicial statement must be read first. Ma'am. Tonight, we are holding quasi-judicial hearings in the following cases. Ordinance 19, 2023, at first reading, a city initiated petition to rezone 13.45 acres. Resolution 58, 2023, a planned unit development PUD amendment. Resolution 59, 2023, a major conditional use approval. This means that the city council is required by law to base its decisions on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official city file on this application, and any documents presented during this hearing. The council is also required by law to allow cross-examination of any witnesses who testify tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, and other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the order of the witness's appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, please fill out a card over here to my right and provide it to our city clerk immediately. <laughs> the city clerk is over here to my left, so we'll need those cards now if you would like them read in. The city clerk will now swear on all persons who intend to offer testimony this evening on any of these cases. If so, will you please rise? So if you have a comment card, this is when you stand up. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you so much. Now, if the clerk would please read the title. Ordinance 12, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78, Land Development, at Article 5, Supplementary District Regulations, Division 5, Natural Resources and Environmentally Significant Lands, Section 78-249, Approval Criteria for Proposed Land Alteration, to remove references to the urban growth boundary and at Section 78-250, Preserve Area Requirements, to allow minor alterations in preserves, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 78 land development shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for the purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to go ahead and open the hearing. Tonight we have a staff presentation. Welcome our planning manager, Martin Fitz. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. I do have a very brief presentation for you for Ordinance 12, 2023. This is a uh, Land Development Regulations Amendment to allow minor alterations in platted preserves. Uh, just a little background, this, was, uh, this issue was brought to our, the city's attention uh, as a result of the FDOT's um, uh, needing to obtain additional right-of-way for the interchange at Central Boulevard and I-95. As a result of that, um, the right-of-way takings that they were doing Seacoast Utility Authority is having to relocate some water mains and reclaim water that is uh, currently running under I-95. And so uh, in, during that process, um, it was determined that, the, the, that they needed to actually relocate those within some of the platted preserves. And we're, while working with staff and Seacoast, we were able to get the, um, the amount of impact in the, into the preserves as little as possible. However, we um, 
this amendment was brought up as to help enable this process. So this amendment is, however, consistent with other uh, provisions within the code to allow for alterations within platter preserves, such as limited infrastructure, such as uh, walkways and paths, and also accessory structures, such as drainage uh, facilities. What we're proposing is uh, one minor uh, cleanup to change, to remove the a reference to the urban growth boundary within the code, uh, which was removed from the, urban, the comprehensive plan last year, excuse me. Uh, for the, uh, as far as the um, limited expansion of public infrastructure uh, by public utilities, also, whenever these are coming in, they'll have to be reviewed by uh, staff they also have to provide public benefits, not just for a single property owner. The alteration must be designed to have the minimal impact possible. And also, if any, um, any disturbance of the ground is required, they'll have to replant with ground covers and native grasses in order to prevent invasive species returning to the site. This was presented to the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board at the August 8th uh, public hearing, and they recommended approval by a vote of 7-0. And staff is recommending approval as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Martin. All right, is anyone wishing to speak yet? All right, we do not have any comment cards on this item, so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 12 2023, please? I'll make a motion on Ordinance 12 2023 on first reading. Second. Oh, okay, Carl and Dana, thank you so much. Let's bring it back for discussion. Anyone have anything they'd like to chip in on this one? Any comments, questions, or otherwise? All right, I did have one or two questions during agenda review and, and what, what my, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Bert, did you have anything? No. You, okay, um, it just sounded like this gave us the opportunity to preserve as much land as possible in moments like this. So it's a, it's a safeguard to keep that, that green space that we love so much here in the city as best as we can in, in these situations. So, all right, let's, uh, no other discussion. Let's uh, get a vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank you. Moving right along to Ordinance 18 and 19. Tonight, Ordinance 18 and 19 will be a combined presentation. Since Ordinance 19 is quasi-judicial, we will declare ex parte at this time. I will go down the line, starting with Carl. Negative. Dana, any ex parte for 18 and 19? No. Okay. Bert, Marcy? None. All right, and I have none myself. And then we're going to ask the clerk to read the title separately for each one, and there will be a separate vote for 18, a separate vote for 19. This is first reading. You guys are welcome to remind me if I start to do both of them at the same time. And they will be separate hearings for Ordinance 18 and Ordinance 19. We will incorporate the presentations and all testimony into the hearing. Thank you, Patty. If you would be so kind as to read the titles. Ordinance 18, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopting a small-scale amendment to its comprehensive plan, future land use map, in accordance with the mandate set forth in Chapter 163, Florida Statutes, pursuant to application number CPSS-23-08-0000, in order to change the land use designation of 13.45 acres, more or less, from Palm Beach County Commercial High, with underlying high residential 12 units per acre CH12, high residential 12 units per acre HR12, and residential low three units per acre RL3 to Palm Beach Gardens residential high RH with the Marina District overlay. The subject property being located on the southwest corner of the intersection of PGA Boulevard and Ellison Wilson Road providing the, for compliance with all requirements of Chapter 163 Florida statutes, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, DEO, providing that the future land use map of the city of Palm Beach, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Note to the public, there is a sign-in sheet at the front table for anyone wanting additional information from the Department of Equal Opportunity, Economic Opportunity, DEO. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go ahead and open the hearing for Ordinance 18. We have a staff presentation tonight from Principal Planner Olivia Ellison. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Olivia Ellison with Planning and Zoning. Now I'll be presenting a combined presentation for two city-initiated ordinances for recently annexed property. 
Ordinance 18 is a small-scale comprehensive plan land use map amendment to assign future land use designations, and Ordinance 19 is the companion zoning designation for approximately 14.45 acres that were recently annexed into the city. And I would like to mention that this request is primarily an administrative function to assign city land use and zoning to re recently annexed property. <laughs> A little background on these areas. On December 14, 2022, City Council adopted Ordinance 15, approving the voluntary annexation of a 10.97 acre area. This site was previously approved in the county for a multi-family family condo development. And on February 2nd, 2023, the City Council adopted Resolution 7 to amend that property to add eight dwelling units and to increase the building height. And on July 13, 2023, City Council adopted Ordinance 13, approving the voluntary annexation of the 2.48 acre area immediately south of that 10.97 acre site. <laughs> and here's a location map of those areas. It's on the southwest corner of PJ Boulevard and Ellison Wilson Road. The current county land use is mixed, commercial high with underlying high residential, 12 units per acre, high residential, 12 units per acre, and residential low, three units per acre. The proposed city land use is residential high with Marina District overlay, and the Marina District is consistent with the county approval. The Marina was approved as an accessory use to the residential development. The, the current counting zoning designations is mixed, is mixed as well. Um, we have residential plan unit development and multifamily residential. <clears throat> the proposed city zoning designation is PUD overlay with the underlying residential high zoning district. And staff believes that providing a unified and consistent zoning district for contiguous parcels is best practice. And these petitions or these ordinances were publicly noticed in accordance with city code, mailers, postings, and newspaper ad. And staff provided the Palm Beach County Intergovernmental <coughs> Plan Amendment Review Committee, IPARC, notice um, on August 30th, 2023, and we have not received any comments to date. And our PZAP board voted uh, seven to zero to recommend approval for what's in front of you, and staff also recommends approval. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Olivia. All right, I don't see anyone will, um, trying to speak. I do not have any comment cards, so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing on Ordinance 18. May I get a motion and a second to approve and bring it back for discussion? I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 18, 2023, first reading. All right. Second. All right, thank you, Dana and Bert. So uh, do we have any further discussion on 18? Nope. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. If we can move on to Ordinance 19, we did already just have the presentation, but we'll have the clerk read the title so we can do it separately. Ordinance 19, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, rezoning certain real property, such property being comprised of 13.5 acres in size, more or less, and located on the southwest corner of the intersection of PGA Boulevard and Ellison Wilson Road, providing that these parcels of real property, which are more particularly described herein, shall be rezoned from Palm Beach County Residential Plan Unit Development, PUD, and Multifamily Residential Medium Density, RM, to Palm Beach Gardens Plan Unit Development, PUD, overlay with an underlying zoning designation of Residential High, RH, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. All right, thank you, Patty. So we've already declared ex parte for this, and we've had our presentation. I don't see anyone wishing to speak. I do not have any comment cards, so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing for Ordinance 19. May I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion on Ordinance 19, 2023, first reading. Second. All right, thank you, Carl and Dana. Do we have any further discussion on 19? Let's go to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you so much. Moving on to Ordinance 28. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 28, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 62 streets, sidewalks, and certain other public places by adopting new Section 62-33 entitled Streetlights in Non-City-Owned Rights-of-Way, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 62 streets, sidewalks, and certain other public places shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. 
Thank you so much. I think our city manager will be speaking on this. Uh, you're all familiar with the situation and the issue that this ordinance address. It's sort of a cleanup thing to clarify the fact that the city will not pay for street lights on non-city owned streets unless we have an interlocal agreement. Thank you, sir. I don't see anyone wishing to speak. I do not have any comment cards. So I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve and bring it back for discussion? I'll make a motion, Ordinance 28 20, 23, first reading. I'll second. All right, thank you so much, Carl and Marcy. Uh, any further discussion from our council? Crystal clear. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you so much. Moving right along, Resolution 58, if the clerk could please read the title. Resolution 58, 2023. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving an amendment to the PGA Marina Planned Unit Development PUD to allow the redevelopment of approximately 7.52 acres with 451 dry boat slips, 20 wet boat slips, and marina retail, boat and watercraft showroom and ship store uses, and approving a conditional use for commercial marina on approximately 7.52 acres. The PGA Marina PUD being generally located on the north side of PGA Boulevard, approximately 0 0.15 miles east of the intersection of PGA Boulevard and Prosperity Farms Road, as more particularly described herein, providing for conditions of approval, providing for waivers, providing an effective date for other purposes. Okay. okay, thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to go ahead and open the hearing for re Resolution 58. We're going to declare ex parte. I'll start to my right with uh, Marcy Tinsley. I do have an ex parte. I spoke to uh, Ken Tuma um, a few times, probably three times. Okay, thank you, Bert. I spoke to Ken Tuma once and just want to recognize all the letters that we received via email from people who were for and against, and there was significant numbers, so I just want to note that for the record. Thank you, Dana. Um, I saw a brief presentation by Ken Tuma at the PGA Corridor Association on September 11th, and I also want to acknowledge all the emails and letters of support and, uh, you know, for non-support for this project. Thank you so much. Carl? Ken is well, but I took the shortcut route, so uh, I'll still claim him as ex parte, but we got it done. Okay, so I, uh, Ken did reach out to me, but I did not call back. So I have not spoken to anybody about this except for the emails that we've received from people in support and people against as well. So we're going to go ahead and have Ken Tuma from Urban Design Studio present to us tonight. Okay, good, good evening, Ken Tum with Urban Design Studio. My address is 610 Clematis Street, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33401. I've been sworn in. Thank you for having me here this evening. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started tonight. As, uh, as you noted, this is a quasi-judicial proceeding and we do intend to protect our rights under that quasi-judicial proceeding with the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses if necessary. Also, I'd like to submit to the record the resumes of our experts that are so they're on file. Sorry. A lot of paper. I apologize. The experts here this evening that are available for your testimony this evening is our transportation engineer, which is Chris Hagen with the firm of Kimley Horn and Associates. We have our civil engineer, Mr. Parrish, is here from the firm of Simmons and White. We have our architect, Ms. Boltman, is here this evening. She is a registered architect, and I have to my left, Lauren Sands, who's an urban planner and AICP planner. Also, we have our clients available this evening, and also our attorneys are available. Mr. Matheson is here also. The presentation this evening is going to be about 45 minutes. I'm warning you in advance. Uh, I have a lot of information to go through. This has been a significant project. It's been going on for many years, and I want to make sure that the opportunity to see this project and the detail and the thought process that's been gone through is part of the record. I'm going to ask Mr. Schnell, who's the president of Port 32, who we represent this evening, to get up and give a quick, brief introduction of Port 32. Then I'm going to come back and begin the presentation. Presentation. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes. Ms. Sands is going to get up. She's going to walk through the details of the waivers and the, and the, and the, and the project itself. And then I'm going to come back and do closing. Uh, thank you. Mr. Stone. 
And just before you begin, if you want to give the clerk those resumes, Mr. Yes, Chairman, yes, so we can enter those as co your composite exhibit one to your application. Great. Thank you, Ken. Good evening, Mayor Reed, Council members. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to present this evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I have been sworn in. Austin Shell, CEO of Port 32 Marinas. Um, so a, cu a couple things about Port 32 Marinas. Um, we have experienced redeveloping and revitalizing um, antiquated facilities such as this one on PGA Boulevard. Uh, but that's not all we are. Um, primarily more than developers, we are long-term owner-operators of marinas. Um, today we own nine marinas, all in the state of Florida, and employ about 240 employees. Um, second is our mission as a company is to provide our surrounding communities with access to public waterways. Um, Without uh, you know, public use of our waterways, there'd be no reason to have marinas. It's truly our reason for being is to serve our surrounding communities. So we see ourselves as, um, our business is architected around serving four stakeholder groups. One is our employees, second is our members, um, and the third and the one that you know, gives us the reason to be here is our surrounding communities. Um, you know, we've all, I hope, been to the River House and seen this project as we drove through the kind of awkward um, access way, uh, which winds through our forklift travel path. Um, we're proud of the transformation that this project uh, would entail. Um, I think not only will it be a marquee facility, certainly the flagship of our portfolio, which meets the standards of Palm Beach Gardens, but also really sets a standard for what a marina can be throughout the whole state of Florida. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Again, Ken Tuma with Urban Design. Uh, I'm going to walk through a few slides here. So the reason why we're here today is what some of us know is PGA Marina, but it's, it was rebranded re about five or six years ago to Port 32. And that happened when Mr. Schnell's company purchased the land. So the subject site located in red on the, scre uh -oh. in red on the screen in front of you, in red on the screen in front of you is a 7.52 acre parcel of land located within the city of Palm Beach Gardens. To the north is, is Savro Harbor, then Marina Gardens. To the northeast is Seminole Marina, and to the, to the west is Harbor Financial Area. Not included in this application is the River House parcel. Now this slide begins to show the history of what's happened here. This has been around since ninth, this marina was built in 1973, 50 years ago. When it was built, it was built by one family, the Savro family, which controlled the entire parcel of land except the Seminole Marina. Over the course of time, a lot of things had happened in this corridor. First, the Harbor Financial Center was parceled off and sold to someone else. Prior to that, the docks in this area were condominiumized, meaning that people own those docks that are identified in green. And then also the river house, uh, if many of you may remember, in late 1989 was constructed and it was obviously is still one of the premier facilities. But when Mr. Callender built this in 1989, it was just an absolute phenomenal asset. And Mr. Straub, the current owner, has done an excellent job of keeping the River House tradition up. And it brings an important part up about this project as seen on this aerial. Those two, for many years, due to the sale of the property, shared an access point. This project fixes that access point. I'm gonna walk you through that when I get a little further into the presentation. What was in front of you this evening is an amendment to a PUD, a plan unit development, a project where the site plan is part of the overall approval. There are 471 boat slips in total, 450 are dry and 20 are wet. For those non-boaters out there, dry means it's in a rack and it's in a slip and a forklift comes and gets it and puts it in the water. 20 are slips that are within the water. The change this evening though, is 57 dry slips. There are seven waivers. Ms. Sands is gonna walk you through those in detail. Three of those waivers are existing conditions today. 
and a, and a, a waiver for, and then there are also a waiver for height and a waiver for parking. One of the waivers by way of example is the existing condition along PGA Boulevard. As you know, your code requires a buffer along PGA Boulevard. We don't meet that criteria. That's an existing condition today. Every utility crosses right in front of PGA or Port 32. Seacoast, FPL, they all cross the intercoastal right by the corner of the bridge. But you'll see in the waiver that Ms. Sands presents to you, we've improved it working with your staff. We've got the area a little bit bigger where we could. We added landscape. My point being, the waivers that are in front of you are waivers, most of them are from existing conditions. Also, a major conditional use is wrapped into this resolution. When this was approved, commercial marinas didn't require uh, com commercial marinas did not require a major conditional use. It's an existing condition. So the physical development program, again, we'll walk you through this slide by slide. There are 425 dry slips, 20 wet slips that are there today, and the water slips. 12 are open air, and those are on the east side of building B. There are also 14 service uh, slips internal to the building. There's a ship store. Ship store is like a convenience store for boaters. You don't drive to this convenience store. You pull your boat up to this convenience store. It has fuel. It has all the needs that you need for boating. There's also a dock master on top of the ship store. The dock master is the person who runs the concert for the facility. They're the conductor. They manage all the movements of the uh, forklifts and the activity that occur in the area. There are also 16 showrooms. This is also subject to one of the waivers too. Those 16 showrooms are air conditioned space for boats, for sails. It, it, um, the way your code works, and again, Ms. Sands will go through this in detail, the way your code works, when we use the word showroom, it articulates it as a showroom like it was a city furniture. That's not what these are. These are air conditioned space for boats. We're not a furniture store. Office, there are office components internal to the buildings. Port 32 has offices. There's also marine retail bays. Those seven bays basically are offices and serve for the uh, 16 showrooms. It's where the sales occur for these boats. On the screen in front of you is a lot of numbers. I'm gonna request that you look at the bottom right hand corner because these are kind of the big changes. We're asking for an additional 37, excuse me, an additional 57 slips. And the height, of, we're requesting an additional 36 feet and four inches from what exists today. That is a total height of 83 feet. So this is the marina as it exists today. You can see the use of the racking system. You have two racks and three racks over here. This is the uh, forklift that splashes the boats into the water. This is the existing building. Inside that building are three layers of rack. The new building that we're proposing tonight are five layers of rack. Um, you'll notice the exterior component being used, the exterior racking system, the service area, and generally kind of the general look of what this is. This is an outdoor facility, outdoor maintenance. What we're proposing is to bring it all inside. All the storage will be inside. In fact, except for two small areas, all the forklift, tra all the forklift traffic will be inside also. So changing this dynamic from an external boatyard with boats uh, all over the place to bring it all internal within a building. This is the new proposed building that's in front of you tonight. This is a subject of our request. Uh, beautifully done architecture. Ms. Bullman is in the audience. She has done a wonderful job. It is very beautiful. We've been working with your staff for many, many months coming up with this design. Let me walk you through some of the highlights and then we'll get into the details later. First here on the right hand side, excuse me, where my mouse is, you'll notice the use of glass. So it looks like, a, so it is intended to show the boats internal and create a nice effect. The use of all the awnings, this area on the ground floor, that's where the office retail space is to serve those 16 uh, showroom bays. So 16 showroom bays, eight on one floor, eight on the other air conditioned space. Um, this is the drop off area. So when you, when you have your boat reserved, this is where you drop off and your boat is in this area. And you'll notice that everything is internal except the small space between the two buildings 
and then over here is where the boats drop off. So this is in plan view, not included in the right hand side. This is the location of the river house. The river house is its own approval. We have a partly, as a part of this application, we do have an administrative amendment because we're amending the river house's application also to allow for access. So while it's not subject to you this evening, we do amend their, uh, their access point also. Um, so on the screen in front of you, you'll notice three buildings. Building A is the ship store and the dock master store. Building B is a storage facility, and building C is a storage facility. So if you have a boat, if your boat is on a rack here in building C, the forklift comes in through building B. It doesn't go outside. It comes in through building B and then goes to building C, pulls your boat out, brings it through building B, and splashes it in the water. I'm not a boater. Mr. Vincent is here who's an expert on this and explain it in more detail, but that is how this facility is going to work. The next thing is probably, in my mind, you know, I've been going to River House for 30 years, right? So as you know, those of you who've gone to the River House, it is a quirky access point going right through the middle of a working waterfront. There are forklifts driving through there. There are boats, there are boats being moved. There's maintenance. Everything is happening in that area. A few years ago, we made it a bit bigger, a bit better with some arms going down, but it's still in the middle of a working industrial site. This plan, one of the public benefits for this plan, changes that access point. In red on the screen in front of you is the existing river house access point overlaid with our site plan. This is the new access point going around the building to the west, all the way to the river house, creating a separate, distinct road network for the river house, aside and away from our building. This is a seven year, uh, or about, excuse me, about five years it's taken to accomplish the owners. There's owners, there's easements, there's rights. I give Mr. Straub, who I believe is in the audience, and Mr. Snow a lot of credit to be able to come up and finally resolve this matter that Max Fricker and Frank Callender put in place 30 years ago when the River House was built. They worked really diligently. This easement is an easement that is not terminating. It is an easement that is controlled by both parties and that will forever provide access to the River House. On this screen is access, circulation, and drop-off. First, I want to talk about access, and Mr. Hagen is in the audience, our professional transportation engineer. He can answer any more specific questions, but just real quick. The, this entrance point here, the right in, right out entrance point that exists today is 50 feet more this way. We've moved it further west to help that access point where you come down from the bridge and that driveway's right there. Move it further west, also creating stacking. The full entrance point, which is the access point today, the Harbor Financial Center and the River House, which has the left turn lane off of PGA Boulevard, that meets all the stacking requirements. We've improved that intersection both for, both for our project, but also for Harbor Financial Center and the River House. We've made some modifications to allow truck traffic to work a little bit better and also to provide that direct access to the River House. So if you're coming to PGA Marina, how do you get, if you come, sorry, sorry, Austin, if you come to Port 32, how do you get there? Port 32, you turn left, you're turning left, I come into the building, I follow the blue dots, and then I come to this roundabout and I drop off my, my, my equipment for fishing or whatever I may be doing on my boat for a day. And then I go park within the facility. It is really important to note, previously this site had a waiver for parking for the boat slips. We do not have a waiver for parking for the boat slips. We have met your city's code. This re redo has allowed us to achieve that. Okay, I'm going to ask Ms. Sands to go through the details, and then I'm going to come back up. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. For the record, Lauren Sands with Urban Design Studio here tonight on behalf of the applicant, and I have been sworn in. Thank you, Ken, for kicking us off. My job tonight is really to try to simplify a lot of the technical aspects of this project. As Ken mentioned, this project has been in process for over five years with the city We've worked very diligently with staff to try to work through 
all the unique site constraints that PJ Marina and Port 32 have faced throughout that timeline. We're gonna start over on the right-hand side of the screen with building A, which is the smallest of our three buildings. This is our ship store and dock master building located right off of the Intracoastal Waterway. This building is approximately 5,500 square feet with 2,300 square feet on the first floor for your ship store. This is a convenience store, but it's not your typical convenience store that you would drive up to if you were off of PJ Boulevard or North Lake, let's say. This is specifically designed to be accessed from the Intracoastal Waterway, whether you're getting on or off your boat for the day or whether you're refueling at the existing fueling stations. This building was also de designed to activate the Intracoastal Waterway by providing additional public areas that are much nicer than what's out there today. There's additional restrooms to serve the patrons who are arriving via boat and the fueling stations are being improved as part of that as well. This is a view from the Intracoastal Waterway if you were facing kind of southwest. The ship store in front of you shows the, the ship store dockmaster building shows the ship store on the first floor with the two fueling stations in front of it. Directly on the right side of the building is your public areas. There's seating and landscaping as well as in the front of the building. Directly behind building A are your 12 open rack systems that Ken mentioned at the beginning. We'll get a view in just a moment here where you can see how that interacts with the rest of the site within this launch area. Behind those open racks is building B, which I'm gonna walk you fully through buildings B and C as well. To the left of the screen here, just under this flag is the existing launch area that's staying in the same place that it is today with the docks remaining in the same location. This embankment that you see is PGA Boulevard. Moving on to building B, which is west of building A, you have your, uh, your open rack systems here, which will get a nice view in just a moment from seasons 52. Building B is the first of our two storage buildings and directly to the south of that is that drop off area that Ken walked us through just a moment ago. This building can hold 176 dry storage slips within its walls. The other component of building B is the showroom, which can accommodate 16 showroom bays, eight on the first floor and eight on the second floor. These were placed specifically adjacent to PJ Boulevard where they could be visible. Ken pointed out where we have those windows and we'll, we'll see some renderings here. But that was designed to create that transparency and that sense of arrival when you're heading westbound or eastbound on PJ Boulevard. They were put there intentionally to provide additional architectural elements as well and to, and to prevent, frankly, the boat barn look that we have out there today. This is a view if you're heading westbound on PGA Boulevard, if you're coming off of the bridge. I want to point out here on the right hand side is the uh, boat barn sliding door. To the left here is your showroom base. So you, I'm going to point out the first floor here on the bottom. If you're following my mouse, it's on the bottom portion of the screen. Then you have the second floor. That is where your showroom space is limited. And that covers the entire frontage along PGA Boulevard within building B. Built, uh, floors three through five on the front portion are storage, and then on the back side of that building, it is five racks of storage with the drive aisle in the middle of building B. A few things I wanna point out here are the improved landscaping from what's out there today. Currently, the buffer that exists, which we are requesting a waiver for, the buffer is being improved, and we worked closely with staff to, frankly, come up with some unique alternatives to provide a unique landscaping here far in excess of what would normally be provided in this area. We're utilizing faux plantings as well as real plantings on the building itself to create that additional green effect as you come across the bridge on PGA Boulevard. This is a view from Seasons 52. Picture if you were having dinner looking across to the west. We're going to start on the right side of the screen here. This is the existing River House restaurant and Tiki Bar. Directly to the left of that is the ship store and dock master building, as well as the two fueling stations. Your open rack system here can accommodate 12 racks. These are mostly utilized for staging, with the first two utilized as wash racks if patients choose, patrons choose to do so. The open door system here, this is where any and every boat that is being stored at this marina will come in and out of. This door completely closes at night, closes during hurricanes, or any other conditions but every boat being stored at this facility will be behind this door as well as the door in building C. This is the existing launch area that is remaining unchanged as part of this application. A Little bit hard to see here, but there's a gated access way here that is at the end of the drop-off that Ken walked us through. 
Directly next to that is the pedestrian access. So when people are dropped off at Port 32, they would come out to this launch area to get on their boat for the day. Moving on to Building C, which is the largest of our three buildings on this site, it can accommodate 249 dry slips. It's important to note that this building is completely encompassing the entire outdoor area that's out there today. The footprint of this building is essentially mimicking where the racks are today. Also inside of Building C are 14 service slips. The service today is mostly outside, so all of that is coming inside into the first floor of Building C. The other component of Building C that's really important to note is there's two types of office. The first type of office are seven marine-related sales. I'm using air quotes if you can see them for a reason because it's really an office component. And this office component functions directly with the showroom. So the showroom in Building B can hold up to 16 showroom boats. And in Building C, let's say, I'm going to use Ken Tuma as an example right now. Let's say Ken Tuma comes to the marina. He wants to buy a boat. He's going to come onto the site. He's going to go to one of the seven retail bays in Building C. He's going to go see Mike Vincent, let's call him. And he's going to say, hey, I want to buy a boat. Mike Vincent, the operator of the marina, is going to walk him over to Building B. They're going to go look at the boats. If Ken Tuma decides to buy one, they will go back over to Building C to finalize that transaction. Hopefully, he does decide to buy a boat. But that's how those two uses function together between Buildings B and C. We do park those seven marine-related sales as a retail component. We are really over parking that between that and the showroom space, but I'm gonna walk us through the showroom calculation in just a little bit. The other portion of office in Building C is for Port 32 offices, there's about 1,300 square feet, and it's spread just throughout the building where they needed them functionally. This is a view of Building C from across the water. This is north taken from Marina Gardens facing southward to the new building. This is taken from about 30 feet in the air. And I wanna point out the distance between where this picture was taken and the closest pinch point of this wall is a football field away. It's about 300 feet. The boats that you see here are the existing boats that are out there today. This picture is from about three months ago. The rendering was superimposed into here to give context to what this area would look like. I want to point out the palm trees along this buffer here, just north of that relocated roadway. Those are existing palms. On the right-hand side of your screen here, this is your entrance off of PGA, that existing entrance off of PGA, connecting to the redesigned northern roadway, eventually leading to the river house off to the left side of the screen. Other things I want to point out here are the additional architectural elements. Although this building is functionally a marina, we are providing four-sided architecture on all three buildings throughout this site. The use of windows and louvers on here to create that transparency on all four sides of the building. The use of additional siding on the first floor to create that break in the building, that visual barrier, as well as additional landscaping and foundation plantings along the entire building on all four sides. The portion I want to point out specifically is this cantilever portion on the right-hand side of the screen. We'll get a, some rendering views of that as you're driving in from PJ Boulevard, but we'll talk about it from an architectural perspective now. This was a functional choice as well as an architectural choice to provide that special interest, not only from this view, but from PGA Boulevard as well. The windows were provided to be extra large so that you could see the boats that are being stored within that area. There is also parking in a driveway underneath this cantilever portion. This is that other view of Building C. This is the existing entrance to the River House. So if you picture going there today, what you're going to see is about an 18 to 20 foot high, low quality ficus hedge. This is what that view would be replaced with. If you continue that, you have PJ Boulevard off to the right here. This is the southwest corner of Building C. The cantilever portion, as you could see, green wall underneath, use of large windows wood elements, additional windows to show the boats stored along PGA Boulevard. And on the first floor here are those retail marine related sail offices. This roadway, if you were to continue straight here, would eventually turn to the right where you can travel to the river house. This marina is a unique use and it requires us to look at it differently than how we look at other commercial properties. And with that being said, we do have to request multiple waivers for this project. Three of these are existing conditions, and I'm going to walk you through what those existing conditions are. We are able to improve some of those as part of this project, and the, the other remaining ones are, are really based on operational concerns for the marina. 
The first waiver that's being requested is for the side setback along the Intracoastal Waterway. This is for the existing docks that are there today. It's really more of a code stipulation. It requires 15 feet, which is nearly impossible to provide with docks along the Intracoastal Waterway. So as we come in for this PUD amendment, it's just something we're putting on the record to, to reflect. The next waiver that's being requested is for height. The existing boat barn that's out there today is 46.6 feet in height, and we are requesting an 83-foot high building across buildings B and C. Building A meets the height requirements. The comprehensive plan, the city's comprehensive plan, allows 90 feet in height in total. The third waiver that's being requested is for an additional sign on the ship store. I showed you a few different angles of the ship store, but essentially this is a safety concern and a safety request. Because the ship store is designed to be accessed from the Intracoastal Waterway, both the sign for the ship store and the dock master are located on the east facade along the Intracoastal Waterway, but we are requesting to have an additional dock master sign on the south facade where it faces the launch area. As I mentioned, the launch area is where all the forklifts are coming. It's where all the pedestrians are getting on and off their boat. So we'd like the opportunity to have that additional dock master sign for safety in case any of those people have to locate the dock master. The fourth waiver that's being requested is an existing condition. This is the PGA Boulevard landscape buffer. The code requires 20 feet, and what's out there today is a low quality buffer ranging in, in just a few feet. Almost half of that is what's out there today. As Ken mentioned, every utility that could possibly be here crosses under the PGA Bridge and under the Intracoastal Waterway at this location. Due to those constraints, we worked with staff to provide some unique opportunities for landscaping, both in the form of movable planters along the buffer where possible, as well as landscaping on the building itself. We are providing the required landscaping where we can. The fifth waiver that's being requested is also an existing condition. We are requesting to reduce the parking space width from the 10 feet that's required in the code to nine and nine and a half foot spaces. This is what is out there today. This is what the marina has operated with as their 50 years here in the city and it works for them operationally and they'd like to request that again. And this does require additional open space which we far exceed as part of this project. The showroom parking calculation is the next waiver. Bear with me here, there's gonna be a little bit of technical information, so I'm gonna to try to go through it as smoothly as I can. But we are requesting a custom showroom parking rate for one parking space per showroom bay that's being provided, and this is only in building B. Again, the eight on each floor. The city code requires one parking space per 500 square feet. And that is essentially for a furniture store, as Ken mentioned, a city furniture, a lazy boy. And that's just not what this use requires, especially working in tandem with the marine related sales in building C. We, providing the code required parking here, just it doesn't make sense logistically, functionally for, for anyone. And that is why we provided this custom parking rate with Chris Hagen, who's in attendance, to speak to that as well. The last waiver that's being requested is for loading spaces. The city code has it based off of a non-residential square footage calculation. Essentially, this entire site is a loading zone, and we are enclosing that and putting those loading zones within buildings. But in the event there ever did need to be a loading situation occurring on this site, we are providing one within the launch area. This is provided behind a gated access way here, and functionally, it meets the needs of Port 32. At this point, I will pass the presentation back over to Ken. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Good evening again. And just for the record, I hope they sell kayaks for me, as Ms. Sands uh, clearly wanted me to buy a boat, but I don't think I'll be able to purchase a boat there. Okay, community outreach. I'm going to spend about five minutes on this. Mr. Matheson is also, Mr. Matheson is also going to come up. We have in, had informal meetings over the years. If anybody who's wanted to meet with us on this project, Sabro Harbor, Harbor Financial Center Business, Marina Gardens, and other interested residents. This is what it looked like when Mr. Snell purchased this property. He's invested a significant amount of money in it to make it better, but it's an industrial outdoor use. You can see the boats sprayed or spread throughout it. It's not what it looks like today, but that's what it looks like when he purchased the property. This is the first plan that we presented in the Marina Gardens. I wasn't there, 
Ms. Booth and Mr. Matheson were there. Ms. Booth, as you know, has retired. They, I believe they laughed us out of the room. And were, uh, but one of the takeaways that I heard from Mr. Matheson and Ms. Booth was, Marina Garden said, put it in a building. So that's what we did. We've enclosed the structure. And that's where this building came from. Now, it's not perfect. There is no doubt there's going to be a debate tonight. And that debate is about height and traffic and a couple other items I'm going to walk you through. But where we are, we've provided this building. It's 83 feet of height. It is bringing all those uses inside. It's eliminated all the noise condition. When, he, when Mr. Schnell redoes this building, he's also going to be purchasing new forklifts, which are much quieter. But this is the building that is in front of you this evening. Now, one item that came up, will this building throw a shadow on our houses? Ms. Boltman is, the, is in the audience. She can testify to the accuracy of this slide. However, in December at 10 a.m. in the morning is the worst time of year. And yes, it does throw a shadow into Savro Harbor. It does not throw a shadow onto the uh, units to the north on Marina Gardens. Height. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about height because it's clearly an item of debate. 83 feet in height is our request. There's 68 feet internal of that is a rack system so that a boat sits on top of it's how that works. 36 is allowed per the zoning code. We're requesting a waiver for that. The comprehensive plan allows us to request a waiver up to 90 feet. What we are, or not a waiver, a total height up to 90 feet. And what we are requesting is 83 feet. So there's a development pattern in the corridor. Your city's comprehensive plan encourages redevelopment. It encourages the use of employment and use of the intercoastal waterway. What are we doing here? We're encouraging the use of the intercoastal waterway. We're protecting a use that's been there for 50 years. Now, a little more background about hikes. It's really important. I sat there in 2006. There was a height shred in this city, and that height shred showed potentially 20 stories on this site and the other four corners. That occurred back in 2006. At one point in time, this facility, this site was approved for a nine-story hotel, 115 feet of height. It had lounges and convention centers. So there is a pattern of what's occurring. This is your comprehensive plan and its strategies to encourage and emphasize the use of the intercoastal waterway. The maximum building height of 90 feet. This is a surrounding height. The Ritz-Carlton here in the bottom right hand, 106 feet. And then the Solera at 62 feet. Someone's going to ask the question, well, Mr. Tuma, the Solera is down a little bit in a hole. Absolutely correct. It's about, down about 20 feet. It's still taller than the building that we're proposing. Solera is the, uh, is the building that's on top of the ridge that Mr. Weir constructed. Operationally, this is a very well thought out user. They have a development, they have a parking operation plan, they have staging plans, they have the all important Port 32 application. It's changed the business, as all of us has changed our business using an iPhone. It allows them to specifically identify reservation, allows Mr. Vincent, who's in the office, who's in, who's in the audience, who's in charge of operations for Florida for Port 32, to be able to manage his forklifts, to be able to be efficient on how the operation works. But also, it controls the amount of boats that go in and out. In reality, there's only so many boats they can splash in one day. Splash is the term when you put the boat in the water. There are boat launch procedures. There are specific fueling procedures, and there's also a hurricane plan. We may have skimmed over that a bit. First thing, the building, I'm the one who said kind of cantilevered first. The building's not really cantilevered. There's columns supporting it. But this building will be, hurric <clears throat> will be a hurricane-rated building, meaning when those doors shut, it's a hurricane-rated building. Sustainability. And there's a couple really key points here that I want to go over. First thing, efficient LED lights. Landscaping, 245% above your requirement. The open space, the open space is above their code requirement. The e, we have an EV charging station. The fueling station that sits out there today, the underground tank is going to be replaced. Any contaminated use will be removed and fixed. That's going to be a brand new underground storage tank. There'll be four, excuse me, there'll be new forklifts that are tier four compliant, 
which are two things. One, much more efficient on fuel and much more quiet. This next bullet point, Mr. Parrish is in the audience. It's really important. Today, this site built in 1973, it's stormwater management. Simple. It runs off and goes to the intercoastal. This new plan will allow us to provide 150% of the required treatment volume um, and it'll limit the discharge and remain less than pre-development stages. There's going to be exfiltration trench in this facility to allow for that water quantity and water quality. Again, Mr. Parrish is here, much more qualified than I am to, to discuss this. And Mr. Snell and Mr. Vinton have made a commitment as they go through this process. They're boaters. Boaters historically are environmentally sensitive. Their company are environmentally sensitive. They're going to look for opportunities to improve as they go through the construction and design development. We have lots of letters of support. Uh, we have four, four, 47 letters of support. The River House is in support of us. In, excuse me. The River House is in, in support of us. That was quite a negotiation between Mr. Straub and Mr. Schnell to be able to fix that access point together. They're working together wonderfully and have that resolved. Harbor Financial Center, what an excellent uh, fix for their facility. The Ritz Carlton res residence. I know Mr. Martinez is here. I heard him get an award tonight. The Palm Beach North Chamber, the PGA Corridor Association, the marine industries of Palm Beach County, existing tenants at PGA Marina, and Palm Beach Gardens residents. I'm going to ask Mr. Matheson to get up as I click on the next slide. You are going to hear a lot of items. Stephen, please. You're going to hear a lot of items. On the screen in front of you are support letters that we've received. Three from residents within Marina Gardens. Mr. Dolan, Mr. Fricker, and Mr. Price. We have other Palm Beach Gardens residents in the center column. And then on the right-hand side, our business. I'm not going to read them because I know they've been submitted to the record. Mr. Matheson is going to read one letter of support for the project, then I'm going to come back and close. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. For the record, my name is Steve Matheson, Matheson Whittles. I have been sworn in. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. I assure you I'll be much shorter than Mr. Tuma. Um, <clears throat> before I start with the uh, letters, I just want to say I'm extremely proud of the team that we assembled for this project and for all the hard work that went in, uh, not only internally, but also helping address uh, issues that affect the city and the really the welfare of, of city businesses and residents as a whole. Uh, Ken alluded to the Seacoast utilities and other major utilities that go through this property. We're solving problems while at the same time we're developing what I believe is, what I'm sure is, a very, very world-class and first-class facility. Um, I'm going to be entering some information into the record. Before I do so, I'm not going to go through all 47 and I believe there's actually some more since these were delivered, support letters. There are just three, and they're very brief. Uh, so if you'll indulge me. First is from Steve Price. Uh, Steve is a resident of Marina Gardens. Steve is at 28 Marina Gardens Drive. He says, and this was provided to your staff, I'm an active member of Port 32 Marina and a resident of Marina Gardens. As a resident and a boater, I would like the project supported, and I believe it brings value and benefit to our community, Palm Beach Gardens. After reviewing the most recent renderings and the proposal, I think that the structure will enhance the appearance of the property and add an element of safety as the new structure can withstand potential weather threats such as hurricanes and tropical storms. In addition, I would much prefer to have a building that supports and enhances the values of our beautiful waterfront in Palm Beach Gardens as opposed to another high-rise residential structure that would only add more congestion to our area. This is a prime piece of property and it certainly warrants the highest and best use for the overall community and I feel the current proposal allows us that option. Stephen W. Price, 28 Marina Gardens Drive. Secondly, John Dolan, 3 Marina Gardens Drive. As a resident of the neighboring property, Marina Gardens, since 2006, and a boat storage customer of PGA Marita since 2011, 
I'm writing to you as a resident who has been peripherally involved in this redevelopment for some time, and I would like to see it completed. From my perspective, this redevelopment can only help our community by allowing Port 32 to upgrade this very rundown facility and deliver a much more professional level of service that is indicative of our city standards. The waterfront area should be a showpiece of our city and has remained an eyesore since I've lived at Marina Gardens. I encourage your department to approve this development as it has dragged on for far too long and I believe has held our city from a significant economic upside. Thank you for your efforts and consideration. John Dolan, he is at 3 Marina Gardens Drive. The final is one that's frankly personally important to me. Um, I think most of us know Max Fricker, who he is and what he has done in the city of Palm Beach Gardens. I've never been Max Fricker's attorney. I've certainly sat across conference room tables and negotiated with him over the years, and I have deep respect for him, both as a human being and as a businessman. Max Fricker, dear members of the planning board and the honorable members of the city council of Palm Beach Gardens, as a resident of the city of Palm Beach Gardens since 1990, I'm delighted to hear that the ugly old boat storage metal building and the unsightly elements on site are being replaced with the state of art new marina and boating center facility, which will be tremendous improvement with economic benefits overall to the city of Palm Beach Gardens community, including an enhanced infrastructure for a second to none service to benefit local boaters at large, which was long overdue in this great city of Palm Beach Gardens. The subject property with its marine development will fit in very nicely with the already well-planned commercial PGA Boulevard. This letter shall serve as my total and unequivocal support for this project to proceed as planned, and I look forward to its realization. Respectfully submitted, H. Max Fricker. That one meant a hell of a lot to me. Uh, with that, what I'd like to do, as I said, is not dwell upon all of the letters of recommendation and urging support for the project. What I will do is I will deliver them to the city clerk. Thank you, Patty. These are the 47 letters which were in, at least when I stopped counting, because I had to get ready for the hearing. Uh, and I want to reiterate that we have a special project. We have a special, very special use here that we need. And we believe that this is the best possible rendition, the best possible future for this property. Thank you. Along with Ken, I would like to reserve the right uh, for rebuttal and cross-examination. And if I might, Madam Mayor, just as a matter of housekeeping, we're going to accept these 47 letters into evidence as the applicant comp composite exhibit number two. Thank you. I'm on my closing slide, so we're about through this. I just want to leave you with a few thoughts in conclusion. The building on the screen is front of, in front of you is the building that we're proposing, a beautiful building. We are very fortunate. The owner of this site is the operator, and he's sitting right over here. You have a very sophisticated owner-operator. No one else owns the land underneath. There's not a REIT. There's not a trust. There's not a triple net lease. and a bot. You have the owner and the operator who owns and manages. It's a very unique opportunity that he has and that they manage these ports across, or excuse me, they manage these type of facilities across Florida. This project has a significant public benefit besides additional landscaping and additional open space. It perfixes the problem of the River House. It's been there since it started when Max and Frank started in 1990. So it corrects that problem. It brings the existing conditions internal to the building. There's no more external repair. There's no more external boat racks except those 12 racks on the east side which are used for staging. Everything is inside the building. 
It eliminates the noise. Those forklifts are internal now, and they're new forklifts, they're quiet. There are only two spots when they're outside, when they go between the two buildings, and when they splash, in the, when they splash, in the, uh, when they splash into the water. The, burp, the building itself is hurricane rated. It is hurricane rated building. It is an 83 foot high building that is hurricane rated with all these metal racks internal to them. It eliminates the stormwater management that should have been eliminated years ago. That shouldn't be flowing into the intercoastal directly as a sheet flow. It should go through a process. This fixes that. Most importantly, this is an $80 million investment that Mr. Snell and Port 32 are prepared to make within the city of Palm Beach Gardens. $80 million. And what does that do? This facility was built in 1973. It's 50 years old. It is reaching the end of its life. Something is going to happen there. This is a 7.52 acre parcel of land. I submit to you that by providing this facility, by constructing this expensive building, that this creates great predictability on what this parcel of land is going to be for the next 30 to 50 years. I believe that this significantly changes what potentially could go there and sticks and it allows that this building will be there again for a very long period of time. As Mr. Matheson said, we have 47 letters of support. We have your staff recommendation on the project on the waivers, we have your planning, zoning, and appeal board unanimous decision. In fact, and there was one speaker who spoke at the planning and zoning board, and he spoke in support of the subject site. This evening, I am requesting your approval on this um, for this for this project within the city of Palm Beach Gardens. And finally, as Mr. Matheson indicated, after public comment, consistent with the rules, I would like the opportunity to rebut public comment. Thank you for your time this evening. I appreciate, I know it's a little longer than normal, and I appreciate your time, and we're happy to answer any questions. We have our whole team assembled. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who spoke. Uh, do we have a staff presentation tonight, Martin? Yes, ma'am, I do have a slightly less uh, lengthy presentation. All right, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the board, for the record, Martin Fitz, Planning and Zoning. And I do have a, a brief presentation. I uh, just want to hit a few highlights. Uh, the applicant did a very good job of, of presenting the project and the, a lot of the particulars, but there are a few things that I do want to uh, point out. Uh, <clears throat> a little briefly about the background. Ken mentioned that there was a, an approval in 1988 for a nine-story hotel. It was a 245-room hotel with uh, convention facilities. As we all know, this was never built. However, it does demonstrate that there was um, a significant height considered for the area. Additionally, in 2006, we had the height charrette. And we've talked about this hotel, but I figured you know, it would be beneficial for everybody to see this. This is the site plan that was approved. Uh, you can see it's located on the north side, immediately adjacent to the Sarville Harbor. <clears throat> And this was a, um, a very large facility. The top of the roof was 115 feet, and it did contain two towers that were approved at 154 feet. <clears throat> Moving forward, we've had uh, quite a few changes uh, to the site approved, primarily uh, trying to address a lot of the circulation and, and those sorts of situations. And this past June, uh, we also have approved the uh, comprehensive plan amendment approving the marina district overlay which was adopted to encourage the active uses of the intracoastal waterway protect marina uses and also allow for heights of up to 90 feet to be requested we've seen the existing condition and the proposed development i do want to point out that uh, the setbacks for the project currently the um, the site is able to meet or exceed all of the uh, setbacks with the exception of the side uh, setback on the intercoastal waterway, and the applicant is requesting the waiver for the zero-foot setback. I do want to point out that the rear setback uh, against Sarville Harbor, the required setback is 15 feet, and the applicant is providing 100, almost 103 feet setback from the property line. Also, point out that the required, 
uh, almost 50,000 square feet of open space, and the applicant is providing uh, 68,000 feet of that. Some of that is to as uh, waiver justification for the reduced parking width, but there's uh, more ab over and above that. <clears throat> I do uh, also want to point out that the uh, the building in question, uh, the closest building, uh, is measured at o over 300 feet from the closest point from any of the neighboring residential property uh, boundary lines. The applicant went over the, uh, the site plan and the access and circulation very well. <clears throat> I do want to point out that you know, Ken mentioned the, the new access road. This is uh, going to be taking all that traffic from internal where, to remove all of the possible conflicts with the boats. And so there will, this will completely remove any of that. There are two gates, so unless you have a reason to be inter internal, um, that access is going to be denied. There will, there, the applicant is improving uh, circulation on site by providing continuous walkways uh, through the site to connect the existing boardwalk along the Several Harbor and the uh, PGA Boulevard sidewalk. It's a seven to eight foot sidewalk. There is also a boardwalk along the northeast corner around the Riverwalk or the Riverhouse restaurant that uh, guests can use to be able to get to the splash area as well. <clears throat> the applicant did a very good job of going over the architecture. I do want to highlight again that these buildings are hurricane rated and completely enclosed. And the applicant has, um, has a requirement to uh, remove all boats and marine equipment internal to the site so that um, as soon as we are, the city is within the 72-hour cone of uncertainty for a hurricane. And the applicant has also indicated that they have additional space uh, within the facility to be able to store additional boats or additional marine equipment for the community. Also, as part of the design, the, the air conditioning equipment for the sales center and the showrooms are actually located internal to the site uh, in, in a mezzanine uh, structure, and also it has an internal gutter system so the water is funneled directly into the underground system. The applicant did a very good job in going over the architecture, so I'll, I won't uh, be redundant there. I do want to uh, talk a little bit about the landscaping. Uh, the, the applicant is providing almost three times the landscaping points that are required for the site. Uh, the palette is primarily focusing on sable and majul palms with uh, additional plantings of Simpson stopper and pink tabs and magnolias, ground covers of pink mealy grass, golden creeper, and also cocoa plum hedges. We've uh, addressed the drainage. Uh, I do want to point out that as part of the permit that the applicant has received, they are required to do annual monitoring of the water quality and provide those to the city on an annual basis as well. <coughs> Ken talked about the, the uh, sustainability uh, initiatives that they're doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I want to talk about parking briefly. Uh, the applicant is able to meet all of the parking requirements uh, or the parking rates for the city with the exception of the showroom rate. And the, our code does allow for applicants to request a uh, custom parking rate as part of the code which the applicant has taken advantage of. With the traffic, uh, the applicant is, or the proposed project will be um, increasing the net new trips of 26 a.m. and 41 p.m. trips. This meets the, um, the Palm Beach County traffic performance standards and also the city's level of service standards. And no new offsite uh, roadway improvements are required with this project. The applicant is, however, increasing mobility options on the site through the internal sidewalk system that I've already mentioned and the bike racks. Uh, I will point, there is a bus stop currently just immediately west of the shared entrance with the uh, Harbor Financial. And uh, we are uh, requiring them to provide an artistic bus shelter at this location if the FDOT will approve it. <clears throat> there is a master signage program that's uh, requested as part of this to provide uh, a uh, unity in the uh, signage, including the uh, one signage waiver. The applicant did a very good job of reviewing the waivers uh, and the justification for those. I would, however, like to uh, briefly talk about the height uh, waiver request. 
the increased height uh, is necessary to allow for the, all of the boat racks to be, uh, include, be internal, along with the maintenance and service operations, and also the forklift operations. Uh, as part of the justification for this, they're providing enhanced architecture and landscaping, uh, as well as the uh, hurricane-rated building. This height is consistent with the uh, Marina District overlay, uh, and it, which it does allow for a, a maximum of 90 feet to be requested with a waiver. This is consistent with the neighboring property heights, such as the Ritz-Carlton and Solara, and it is less than the previously approved 154-foot hotel. Uh, in addition to the other waivers, um, or in addition to that, they have provided additional uh, justification for the uh, waivers, such as the, the green roof and green wall, and the trees and movable planters in, in, over the utility easement in case any work needs to be done. As Ken mentioned, there's a ma major conditional use uh, approval as part of this. This is uh, required because of the total re uh, redevelopment of the site. There, the code contains criteria that is required to be met, and the applicant has been able to meet all of those requirements. This is consistent with our comprehensive plan, both with the goals, objectives, and policies, <clears throat> including the PGA corridor overlay and the marina district overlay by providing this mixture of uses that supports the enjoyment of the water, intercoastal waterway. The applicant uh, detailed their community outreach. Uh, the city has received uh, some letters of opposition from mm -hmm. Marina Gardens residents and the POA board, as well as the letters of support uh, that the applicant has addressed as well. The applicant did uh, indicate that they made uh, quite a few changes to this uh, program as a result of these discussions, including completely enclosing the boat, the boat racks, reducing the overall number of additional boat slips and designing for hurricane and conducting the shade study. Just a, briefly with the letters of opposition and support that we received, the applicant, as we said, has gone through those very well. This was presented to the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board at the September 12th public hearing and was recommended for both petitions by votes of, of approval by votes of 7-0. This was publicly noticed both in the newspaper and signs posted as well as mailers being sent to the property owners and staff is recommending approval of resolution 58 2023 as presented including the approval for the major conditional use and approval of seven waivers the staff is available if you have any questions all right thank you so much everybody i do have some comment cards we have over 20 comment cards this evening so i'm just going to reiterate what we said at the beginning we ask you to please be courteous, respectful, allow others to complete their comments without interruption, without noises, without gestures. Do not clap, cajole, or ridicule any speaker. Please utilize common courtesy. Any action that is disruptive of our orderly conduct of this meeting, out of respect for all of us, out of accordance with this basic principle of decorum, will be ruled out of order and will result from being removed from the proceedings. So that said, you'll be having three minutes, and we discussed those 150 words. So uh, I'll be calling out your names. If you would be so good as to come up, state your name and your address and whether or not you have been sworn in. I'll call the name of the person who's going to speak as well as the person who will be going after them so you can be prepared to go since we do have over 20 cards this evening. So the first up is Chip Rath. If you come up to the podium, state your name, your address, and if you've been sworn in. I just hello. Uh, my name is I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. And after that is Marissa Rath. Okay. Uh, my name is Chip Rath. I live at 22 Marina Gardens, and I have been sworn in. Uh, I'd like to hit just a couple um, points that are short but very foundational uh, and problematic with the process. Hold on just a second. I'm going to stop your clock for a second. I just want to let you, you uh, submitted these into evidence, and we are accepting these as Mr. Rath's uh, exhibit. We're going to provide a copy to the applicant's attorney for his review and then hand out these for the council for your review. We accept these into evidence as Mr. Rath's composite exhibit number one. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Patty, okay. if we could restart for him, it would be really nice. Thank you. That's right, Mr. Rath. We'll start you three minutes over. Okay. Here you go. Um, 
I want to hit on a couple of points uh, that are foundational and problematic with the process. Uh, it's uh, my understanding that the city requires consistent, regular communication for the purpose of cooperation and compromise between a developer and the residents. There has been no communication, um, uh, much less any coordination or compromise uh, with the community of Marina Gardens. Uh, we have not met or even heard from the developer from the time of May of 2022 until August of 2023. Uh, that's 13 months where we didn't get a phone call, a letter, a meeting, nothing. Uh, as far as we were concerned, we kind of thought the thing was t uh, tabled. I thought it was incumbent on the developer <clears throat> to be in contact with us, discuss their plans, <clears throat> and uh, reach a compromise if, uh, if at all possible. The uh, next uh, foundational uh, problem I'll cite is uh, the uh, tiering policy, it's policy 1.3.10.1. Uh, it has to do with tiering, uh, and uh, there, uh, tiering, uh, shall, tiering shall be established, tiering standards shall be established for compatible development adjacent to residential. There's been no discussion of t uh, tiering. In fact, I don't think that policy that I referenced uh, has even been passed. And so we're looking at this overlay that allows 90 feet, but the uh, tiering policy I don't believe has been passed. And I don't think, or I don't believe, that you could pass um, a waiver like this if this uh, policy or this uh, restriction uh, isn't in place. Uh, the uh, tiering says that the staggering height and buffers are required. Uh, nextly, the traffic study that's being used in this particular process, in, in this pro tonight, uh, is actually dated September of 22. That's the off-season, and it's not uh, representative at all of traffic uh, during the high season. And therefore, I, I don't think an off-season uh, traffic study is relevant. And then lastly, uh, fire safety. You have 450 boats. Um, the, the target uh, uh, boat size is 35 feet. 35-foot Th boat will have three 400 uh, gallons of fuel in it. It'll have multiple batteries. It'll have electronics. And uh, that many boats in an enclosed warehouse. Uh, one boat catches on fire. One boat catches fire, it will be a fire that can't be put out, and we'll only watch it. This project is immediately adjacent Mr. to Roth, P PGA. I'm sorry. We have so many cards this evening. We want to allow everyone the same amount of time. Thank you. I appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. Next will be Marissa Rath, and then, again, forgive me for pronunciations tonight, please, uh, Robert Gervasi after that. I, do I submit now? Um, oh, if you have anything, please always go right. Uh, you can head over to our clerk and... Ask for submission. Oh, we have uh, council has a quick question for staff. Is there a way for the monitor that's up on the podium to be lowered a little bit so we can see faces better? Thank you so much. They'll, they'll come and help you. I can stand over here. Oh, that's, no, then we have to, we want you to be recorded for the record, so we want to, but we want to see you, so hang in there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay, if you want to, um, Ms. Rath, we can step over here to this other microphone while we get that organized, and we appreciate that. You'll have three minutes if you'd be so kind as to state your name. My name is Marisa oh. Rath. Oh. Okay. All right, we're good. All right, come on back. All right, so three right. minutes if you can state your name, address, and if you've been sworn in. Okay. Uh, my name is Marie Sarath. I live at 22 Marina Gardens Drive. I have been sworn in. Uh, I have lived in Palm Beach Gardens for 10 years in a community adjacent to the proposed marina development. As we mentioned earlier, there's a picture of it right there on the wall. As president of the Marina Gardens Homeowners Association, I represent the interests of 65 Palm Beach Gardens homeowners. 
we are opposed to the approval of this project for several reasons. The size of the proposed buildings is excessive, exceeding the current height restrictions by more than 100%. The marina will not fit into the character of the surrounding buildings or the east end of the PGA cor corridor. The warehouse style of the building will make the structures appear even larger. I have submitted a picture uh, of, the, of the view from my home, and on the picture I've superimposed the outline of the proposed buildings. As you will see when you get that picture, those buildings will tower over us. The former CEO for the developer, Joe Miller, stated at a board meeting last year that he could not make money on the project if it was not 83 feet tall. He knew what the height restrictions were when he purchased the property. It should not be the practice of Palm Beach Gardens to allow a developer to force a waiver on height to accommodate his business plan. A waiver should not be granted when no hardship exists. This area could be developed as a marina without the excessive height. 35-foot racks around the perimeter of the property would accommodate the same number of boats as 83-foot warehouses. No waiver needed. There are no other marina buildings of this size in the area. The Port 32 group has a marina in Fort Lauderdale that is similar to the in size. However, it's located adjacent to I-95 in an industrial area. There has been no cooperation with Marina Gardens from the developer on this project. They have attended four board meetings over the past three years. Every visit has included a presentation of their design, followed by a stone wall in terms of negotiation. This project, in fact, has gotten larger and more intrusive to our community. We were advised by a member of the planning department that the developer stated that they had worked with our community. The statement is untrue as it relates to Marina Gardens. We met with the developer in May of 22 and did not receive any further communication until August of 23. That is 15 months. We believe that the planning board and the city council have been misled by the developer regarding cooperation. We should have a seat at the table regarding the design of this project. In, in fact, we believe that your city code requires that developers work with communities that will be directly impacted. Your zoning plan to create a marina district includes a requirement of, for tiering of buildings to improve appearances. This has been ignored with the current design. The property values in our community will suffer a severe reduction if this project is allowed to proceed with the current design. We hope you will consider you the so financial much. interests of the residents of your city before the profits of an out-of-state developer. Thank you so much. All right, we'll be moving on to Robert Gervaisi. You will have three minutes if you could state your name, address, and if you've been sworn in or not. And after Mr. Gervaisi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I apologize, yes. uh, we have Robert Donovan. And just Thank before you. you start his clock, I just wanted to um, note for the record, we accepted um, Ms. Rath's um, exhibit, her composite exhibit, into evidence on her behalf. Thank you, Max. Thank, Thank you, you Mayor Reed. I am sworn in. I'm Dr. Robert Gervaisi, 63 Marina Gardens Drive. My wife and I have owned our home since 2012. Um, I have to agree with the two previous speakers completely. And um, I also have to respectfully correct one point of argument. It was stated that uh, a nine-story hotel was approved in 1988. That really is not relevant to the conversation at all, because if there were a nine-story hotel, Marina Gardens probably would never exist. No one would have placed that community next to a nine-story hotel. And similarly, placing it next to an 83-foot-tall building uh, is really inappropriate. I also agree with uh, the Raths that the colleagues from Port 32 have been evasive. They came on Monday, three days ago, to a board meeting. It seemed like to check off the box so that they could say tonight that they had met, but it didn't really seem like their heart was in it. And I asked, as a business guy uh, and a university president, I asked uh, Mr. Matheson, what is the business uh, parameters of this? Why do you need to add, the bottom line is, they want your permission to add 57 boat slips to the hundreds already there. So I said, why do you need that 57? What is your alternative business plan 
if your proposal is rejected, how much, how much lower could that building be without the additional 57 uh, boat slips? What's the alternative business plan? And he, said, and he just brushed me off and said, oh, I'll share that at city council meeting on Thursday. Well, I didn't hear anything, did you, about the business uh, consequences of the additional 57 boat slips? What is the bottom line? Why do they need that? Why should neighbors and the city of Palm Beach Gardens subsidize excessive profit when they're not willing to justify it in a reasonable way? Believe it or not, I'm giving you 35 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, if, if that could continue, if, if there are points that you're hoping to make that are repetitive, please do say, I agree with so-and-so who spoke again. You'll, you'll still be entitled to your three minutes, of course, but that way we'll understand what you're saying and, and, and you guys will all have the opportunity to speak fairly. So we have uh, Robert Donovan followed by Stephen Marr, I believe. I would like to... Um if you could speak into the microphone, sir, that way we have you on record. I would like to just present uh, documents, uh, letters of opposition, and a signed petition that opposes the um, height of the project. All right, help yourself over there to the clerk. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry, sir. I, let's, well, I'm so sorry. In, in all fairness, we have tw over 20 cards, and we really appreciate it. Let's go through everybody, give everyone one chance to speak. We even do that up on our council. We all get one chance to speak before we all come back to each other, just out of manners. Thank you so much for your concern. If you could state your name and address, please. And good, e been good evening. My name is Robert Donovan, and I live at 19 Marina Gardens Drive. And have you been sworn in, sir? I've been sworn in, and I agree with the other comments of our residents that have spoken before me. Uh, I'd like to say that we purchased our home in Marina Gardens um, for the beautiful view of Sovereign Harbor and the surrounding statics. We are highly opposed to the development of the marina in its current form. We're not trying to prevent the redevelopment of the marina. The developer purchased the property knowing the current height restrictions of 36 feet. We find it egregious that the developer has been granted a waiver by the planning board and is allowed to construct two buildings 83 feet in height. Their appearance will look like two giant Amazon warehouses. We, would, we don't object to reasonable development. It is more than doubling the height, and it is not consistent with the architecture in the community. Moreover, these massive facilities aren't comparable to any other structures in the surrounding area. We ask that the planning, that the planning board and that the city council really look at the fact that we are direct abutters. And I'm sure they're gonna have a number of people in support, but we find that you're changing the entire character of the area and it's not what we envisioned for our beautiful city. And when you look at the pictures, the size of the buildings driving over the bridge on PGA are just massive. And I think that I, you folks, I know, rely on the planning board uh, for backup. But I want to say to you as a resident, it is most important that you consider this height of, height of these buildings and the look of the buildings that are gonna be there forever. And this is what we object to. It's just, the height is just unacceptable and it changes the city of Palm Beach Gardens. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, sir. All right, so we have um, 
Joyce Gibbs. Sorry, that's right. Uh, Steve Marr first, I apologize. And then after you is Joyce Gibbs. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, council members. I, I won't be long because uh, uh, Rob stole my notes. Everything I was going to say, you just heard, uh, which is a little disappointing. Uh, sorry, sir. We need your name address. I'm concerned. sorry, St Steve Marr, um, uh, to Marina Gardens Drive, and I have. I'm going into my tenth year of ownership there, and I am under oath. Excellent. Thank you. And sir. I'm a retired Boston uh, contractor that dealt in building buildings such as what we have proposed, you know, here tonight and that we're reviewing. But, but I must say, <clears throat> earlier this evening, I introduced myself to the Port 32 representatives. And very nice gentlemen, I was happy to meet them. But all I could think to myself is that Marissa Rath, our president, who has reached out and tried so <clears throat> uh, vigorously to have meetings, to submit certified letters, uh, and that it really never happened. And I don't understand really why we're here today as opposed to having 65 owners meeting with Port 32 and UDS to save the time of all of you. I mean, we should be in agreement. And I don't understand the stonewall <clears throat> of the Marina Gardens Owners Association in the process. And I hope that what you decide to do is to table it to force the parties to come together, to come to a reasonable resolution that we all agree to. It just is, in my business career, part of the Zoning Commission in the city of Boston, that's what happened. If we had a building that was going up, we would be meeting with the abutters, permits would be granted, and the project would go forward. So thank you for your time, and hopefully we do get this tabled. There are some great people. I'm sure we can work it out. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next is Joyce Gibbs, and then following uh, Ms. Gibbs, we have Ben Brock. Thank you. If you could speak into the microphone, ma'am. I had a letter sent for the guard. If you could the podium, please. Over there by the big podium is probably the best bet. Thank I'm sorry. You. I wrote a letter today, and I sent it, but all the emails were bounced back. So do I have to put this in for submission? If you'd like it okay. to be ready. Can I do it after I speak and then give it to you? OK. My name is Joyce Gibbs. I am under oath. I'm, a, I'm at 61 Marina Gardens, and I'm also an owner of a boat slip at, at 61 in the harbor. Okay, so I can vote both ways. My husband and I are both an objector to this, and I'll explain something. When we, I, the only notice I ever got was as a, as a slip owner was at the planning meeting, the city's meeting back in May when you approved the rezoning. At that meeting, there are a lot of board members here, including myself, who spoke in front of you, and we were questioning about the height, and we were told, don't worry about it. that's not what this is about, okay? Little did we know at that meeting, when you're changing the zoning, you're also raising the height to 90 feet in one of the waivers. And from my understanding, that's what raised them up to 90 feet. I was upset. Uh, then the, the community told us what was going on, no notices. I called the planning commissioner, planning board, uh, this week. And the answer I got in some of the questions that I asked was, um, what kind of notice was given to, to the public? Now, he says there was a sign. Did the sign say the waivers that they were going after? Were they specifically listed what those waivers were? Had our community, because the, the, the other the, uh, developers have not been in our community at all since May of last year, and now it's come in after the fact, tried to come in the community just recently. Did we know what waivers they were going for? I did look at the sites when these, this project was going up. I even said to the planning board person that when I looked at it, it wasn't uh, 83 feet. It was more like 45 feet, a store in the bottom, two racks on top, and closed. Then all of a sudden, we find out now it is 83 feet. Why? Where's the hardship? It's a hardship to the community, but it's not a hardship to them. 
It's to pocket money for them and destroy the values of the community. So I hope you reconsider what you're doing. And I'd like to submit this, my petition. Thank you. Uh, ben Brock, please. And then after Ben Brock, we'll have Austin um, Burkett, I believe. B-U-R-K-E-T-T. -T. So Ben Brock, please, sir, if your name, address, and if you've been sworn in. Ben Brock, I'm with at 25 Marina Gardens Drive, and I have been sworn in. Uh, and I'm here just as uh, I agree with the following statements that have been made, and I'm here just to oppose the uh, excessive height restriction that's been requested. Thank you, sir, so much. We appreciate that. Moving on, we have um, Austin Burkett, B-U-R-K-E-T-T, -T, I believe. Thank you. After Austin Burkett, we'll have uh, Charlie Trepkos. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Austin Burkett, uh, 1120 11th Lane, Palm Beach Gardens. I've been sworn in. Uh, I am the board president of the Marine Industries Association of Palm Beach County. You probably saw our support letter up there. Um, I don't know if any of you read it or not, but we are advocating today amongst our 450 not only business members, but voter members as well in support for Port 32's new redevelopment plan. Um, this new plan kind of, it, it touches every pillar that we believe in. Uh, I know a lot of residents had questions about why 57 more slips, but voter access is something that we are losing every day in this industry. Uh, it's not really fair to, to not create more slips for everybody and residents of Palm, of Palm Beach Gardens to use. Uh, there hasn't been any other marina trying to do this, and, and I really, really appreciate what we see them doing now. Something that's very interesting with their marina that we haven't seen in our county is the fact that they are going to contain almost all of the work inside the buildings. I can't really understand why the residents don't see that having all the forklifts, the marine mechanics, everybody inside the building working on the boats and operating and cleaning them is not better for their property value. You won't have the diesel fumes, you won't have the engine noises in the morning, you won't have any of that anymore. It'll all be contained. And contained with a building that, I mean, we were really surprised when we saw that they are doing what they're doing for the exterior with the plants and, and absolutely everything they're doing to make it look as nice as they are. Um, that kind of brings me on to my next point of, with everything being self-contained, they're creating more jobs for our area. Um, the marine industry, we're running out of people. Everybody's aging out right now. People are either retiring, selling their businesses, commercial, uh, marine workshops are, are falling to being new residential high-rises. Uh, what they're doing is they're creating these seven new areas to have new businesses in, uh, or some that are already existing, such as Marine Max, uh, and, and have more jobs created there. Uh, lastly, I mean, this is something that's kind of not on the marine industry side, more as a resident side. You guys have this amazing waterfront plan right now. You have, you have the Brits Carlton residents going up, which are going to be beautiful. Waterway Cafe getting done as we speak. And then you're going to have this marina that unless you let them redevelop, it's going to stay the same. And it's going to just, it's going to be an eyesore in a sense. It won't complete that total waterfront package that I believe Palm Beach Gardens has ahead of them. Uh, so we... Marine Industries of Palm Beach County, we do nothing but support them, and we hope that you all make the same decision in that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Charlie Trepkos, and then after that will be Alex Warner, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Charlie Trepkos. Uh, I live at 170 Satinwood Lane. Uh, I've been sworn in. Uh, I've been, uh, and my family and I have been in Palm Beach Gardens for 25 years. Uh, we've uh, been local residents, very active in the community. I've driven over that PGA Bridge millions of times, and I've seen that eyesore and, and the boats for many, many years. Um, I've had my boat in uh, Port 32 for a little over three years. I brought my boat there because of the great location um, and the, uh, unfortunately, not the great facility. Uh, and as I've been there for a few years, um, I've realized that the location of the marina is absolutely phenomenal, but the facility needs a total overhaul. Uh, and there's not much you could do to a 50-year-old building. Uh, I believe that's about how old it is. Um, and for, for this company to invest $80 million in a state-of-the-art facility for boaters is phenomenal. And it's something that we've lost, as the last gentleman just mentioned, we've lost uh, water access. 
uh, boaters are having uh, to go and look at other cities for proper facilities, whether it's Riviera Beach, uh, Boynton Beach, the Quest of Jupiter, uh, when we have the best city in the North County in Palm Beach Gardens, and boaters should have the best facilities to enjoy convenient local boating. So I would recommend, and I hope this project gets approved uh, in the form that it's already been submitted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Alex Warner. After Alex Warner, we will have Jason Mara, please. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me here. My name is Alex Warner. Uh, I live at 602 Northwest 8th Avenue in Delray. Um, and you've been sworn in? And I've been sworn in, yes. Um, I own a business at, at Port 32 called Gulfstream Boat Club. Um, we provide a, an alternative, a uh, premium alternative to boat ownership um, and have hundreds of uh, local Palm Beach residents who are our members. Um, our members are really excited about this project. Uh, they feel that we really, they and I feel we really need to upgrade this marina, the facilities um, for a number of reasons. Um, line of sight is important for us. We want to see the boats coming and going and be able to operate properly and safely. Um, and just as other people have said, the marina really needs a, an overhaul um, and, and be brought up to the standards that, that I see around other parts of Palm Beach Gardens. Um, I wanted to just take a minute. I've gotten to know the Port 32 leadership team um, over the three years I've been there. And, and these are really quality people, great operators. Um, I trust them, and I think that they've put together an incredible project here. Um, boating's a part of the heartbeat of, of this community. I've been in this for 15 years, and you know, like I said, we have hundreds and hundreds of families and people that come and take their time to come out and, and boat with us, and there's just not enough space, like Austin said. Um, we need more space. We need more access to the water. Um, it's, it's arguably the, the most exciting natural resource that South Florida has, and this is going to be a, you know, a kind of pioneer project in this space. So um, we're fully in support, and like I said, the hundreds of members that we have who are local residents here um, have all expressed the same to me. So I hope you'll approve it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jason Mara. Thank you. After Jason Mara, we'll have Alberto uh, Paradella. Paradella. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Jason Mara, 42 Marina Gardens Drive. I have been sworn in. Um, I'm on an interior unit, a two-story unit in Marina Gardens. So I'm surrounded by the three-story. So where I am in all the interior units, we do not see the marina at all. We will, however, see the building if it's 80-something feet high. It'll be towering over the three-story building. So I'm in agreement with my neighbors. We want to have a place developed. It is an eyesore. And it is very tall already as you're coming over the bridge. You notice it coming over the PGA Bridge. So that's it. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Thank you so much. We have Alberto Paradella, please. And that will be followed by Merrick Tendrick. Thank you, sir. Good evening. I am Albert uh, Paradella. I reside at 1500 Southwest 17th Terrace in Miami, but I do a lot of business in Palm Beach Gardens. I am speaking in support of Port 32. I have been sworn in. I am the account director for Forklift Exchange, which supports marina operations worldwide, including Port 32 Marina here in Palm Beach Gardens. As someone who sees countless marinas across the world, I can assure you that the proposed facility will not only bring huge upgrades to the facility itself, but also in terms of equipment and services supporting operations. The new marina facility will feature the latest technology in marina forklifts to raise and move boats, and they will be used almost entirely indoors. All new forklifts comply with the strictest EPA and OSHA standards, including Tier 4 Final. This leads to engines that are significantly quieter and cleaner for the environment. As you're considering this project, please take into consideration that it will be quieter for those in the surrounding area and have more sustainable features in the existing facility that sits there today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next, we have Merrick Tendrick. After Merrick Tendrick, we'll have Guy Randall. Thank you. How are you doing? Good evening. I've been sworn in. I'm Merrick Tendrick, 1624 Bowood Road. 
Um, how you doing? Uh, I'm originally from Miami. I've been up here for about seven years and starting to see the change that we saw down in Miami. And I have, am a member of Port 32 as well. And I was a boat member of a very similar place down in Miami and saw the same changes. I'm in huge support of this because you're going to see a big difference, obviously, as others have seen, have, have talked about uh, the conditions and it does need the upgrade. And they've done several of these uh, down in Miami and you've seen a change in the benefits. Um, they have a great staff. Uh, they're, 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 it's great for the community, I think, for the landscape. It's going to look really good. Along with that, I'm a firefighter down in Miami. I work on uh, one of our fireboats and talking with Port 32, we're going to try to do uh, kind of we're in the works now to do a little more boat, boater safety awareness and uh, along with some CPR classes for the members and for the community. And being on our fireboat, I'm seeing a lot of uh, the accidents, and I think it's something very important and have the opportunity to work with an organization like this. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Next we have Guy Randall, and then after that will be Joey Eichner. So, uh, Mr. Randall, if you could come to the podium, state your name, your address, and if you've been sworn in. Good evening. My name's Guy Randall. Um, I live at 445 Woodview Circle, Palm Beach Gardens. I have been sworn in. Um, I've been going to this marina since 2000 to 2004, just came back 2013. It's very important to keep this place. Um, we need to uh, have water access for the people that are working in Palm Beach Gardens and also the people that don't work. There's just condos going everywhere. We need, this is the place where I've raised my kids, been going to Peanut Island since 85. My kids, um, he works at West Marine. We, um, Bowdoin's a family. It's all about making memories. And if we are not allowing this marina to move forward, then we're just cutting it off. And I agree with everybody out there. And uh, please make this uh, marina happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Next we have Joey Eichner. And after Mr. Eichner, it is, oh goodness. Good evening for oh, the rec. I'm so sorry. Real quick, Joey. After you, you'll have Nicholas Pavluk something kiss. I apologize. <laughs> All right, Joey. I can... Good evening, Mayor, uh, Mayor and, and Council. I'm going to speak for two organizations within the three minutes, so I'm going to speak very quickly. On behalf of the PGA Carter Association, it's our mission to preserve, enhance, and promote the PGA Carter as the premier business location in Palm Beach County. After having Port 32 reach out to us to give us a presentation on behalf of our members and the business community, uh, our board uh, found that it checks all three boxes of what we're looking for. It, is, it will preserve the waterfront for the public. It will enhance what is there now that's 50 years old and looking terrible. And it will promote this area at, with the, with the uh, high end that they're doing, the, it's state-of-the-art facility. It's just amazing. Now let me put my other hat on. As a senior uh, member of the development team for the Ritz-Carlton, which is a neighbor, which is across the street, which is in proximity, which has homes from four and a half million to over $15 million. We believe this facility will, uh, will, will never harm the uh, value of our property and we think it'll only enhance it. It'll enhance it because the community will have more use and access to the waterfront, which is what people down here are looking for. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. All right, Nicholas Pavlukas, and I'm so sorry for how I'm pronouncing your last name. If you could come on up. Uh, name, yeah, Nicholas, that's the alphabet after your name. Um, if you could name, address, and if you've been sworn in, please, sir. Okay. Um, after that, we have Heather, I'm sorry, Joshua Levine. Thank you, afterwards. My name is Nicholas Pavlakis. And I am a resident at 11900 Valencia Gardens Avenue, and I am with, and for the record, I have been sworn in. I am the business manager at Marine Max, one of the tenants at Port 32, and for the record, I am in favor of all the enhancements. I'm going to start this off with the Marine Max mission statement. I know a lot of people know who we are, but might not know what we are about. Our mission is to provide the world's best pleasure boating experience by consistently exceeding the greatest expectations of our customers, our team members, and our shareholders. Let me break that down, what it is, and how it aligns with this project. Providing the world's best pleasure boating experience, this is done by this, there is a need to do this out of world-class facility, not a good experience, not a decent experience, but one that is in a class of its own. 
from sales of the finest brands to continuous education through intro to boating classes and women on water seminars, our job doesn't start until after the sale of the boat. Boating safety is always our number one goal in promoting safe boating on the water as the market grows is a necessity. Consistently exceeding the greatest expectations of our customers, team members, and shareholders, a location to be proud of. Customers are proud to boat out of here and do business. Team members are proud to work here. Shareholders are proud to fly the Marine Max flag and hang this very mission statement on the wall. Every marina in the area has a wait list of 40 plus people for storage and a lot of times you can't even get on that wait list. We live and boat in one of the most beautiful destinations in the whole country. We don't have access to it. We can't even use it. I know a question's been brought up a lot tonight. Why so many slips? We need them, okay? And I know that that is accessibility is probably the biggest problem around here. This is the facility that Palm Beach Gardens wants. This is the facility that Palm Beach Gardens needs. And most importantly, this is the facility that we deserve to facilitate the large and growing boating community. I look forward to getting each and every one of you at Port, Port, 42, Port 32 and in the boating community, both personally and professionally. I look forward to the new facility and being proud of Palm Beach, proud of Port 32, proud of Marine Max Palm Beach Gardens. Thanks again and I'll see you guys out on the water. All right, thank you so much. Next we have Joshua Levine. After Joshua Levine will be Heather Robbins. Hello, good evening. My name is Joshua Levine at 2385 PGA Boulevard. Uh, I represent Marine Max. I'm the district uh, manager. I manage the Marine Max locations. Will you? Um, oh, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, sworn in? I am sworn in. Yes. Um, I'm the district manager for the East Coast of Florida. I manage the locations from Stewart down south to Pompano. Uh, Marine Max is the world's largest boat and yacht retailer in the world. We've got over 80 locations. Uh, in the United States, obviously most of them uh, here in Florida and along the East Coast. Um, I'm relatively new to this area. I moved here in about six months ago from the Tampa St. Petersburg area. I was going to hide that fact from you guys because uh, I thought it would hurt my credibility, but I said, why not? Because um, I've got a unique perspective. Uh, when I first came over here, obviously I know everything about Marine Max, but I didn't know much about Palm Beach Gardens. But I love the, the, love the area, love the city, everything's very beautiful. <laughs> Uh, when I got to the marina, I was uh, less than pleasantly surprised. Um, comments such as, wow, this is it? And this isn't normal for what Marine Max does and partners with around the United States. And I've heard the comments. I've heard some of the comments from our customers, uh, from some of our team members back at our corporate office in Clearwater. And the comments are pretty much all the same. Hey, when are they going to tear down that place? When are they going to invest money in that place? Uh, or even worse, when are you guys going to move out of there and move to a better facility? But I got news for you. We're committed to the city of Palm Beach uh, Gardens. Uh, we're excited to partner with our landlord. Um, we've got a, a unique case here. They want to improve the facility. They want to spend $80 million to invest in this facility and into the future. Uh, maybe you haven't seen this facility up close, but I encourage you to walk around it. See how rough it is. Uh, rusting metal cracked concrete driveways, the potholes, deteriorating seawalls, saltwater pools that you have to drive through to get around the property. Uh, respectfully, it's, a, it's pretty much a mess. Um, regarding safety and cleanliness, we've mentioned that uh, previously this evening, marinas that are 50 years old don't even come close to comparing the current codes, safety improvements, and environmental standards. Uh, many of our stores are designated clean marina facilities with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, this marina does not qualify because of the massive amounts of runoff off the facility. So one thing is for sure with this new facility is we will be able to meet that requirement in hand in hand with the state of Florida. Uh, with this new facility, it will help us revitalize the local waterway and improve the experience of boaters and non-boaters. It will be cleaner, it will be safer, more efficient and ultimately bring more people to the waterway. Again, we're thankful to Port 32's ability and willingness to invest with us in the community. And by doing so, we can turn this old structure into a modern and true destination landmark that we can all be proud of. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, next we have Heather Robbins. And then after Heather, we'll have Zach Salvatore, please. 
Good evening, Heather Robbins. I have been sworn in. I reside at 11025 Legacy Boulevard here in Palm Beach Gardens, and I've been in the community for over 30 years. I was very pleased to see the recent news about the redevelopment of the PGA Marina. I grew up in Palm Beach Gardens, and I love living and working here today. One of my favorite pastimes is being on the water in the intercoastal, enjoying one of the many beautiful waterfront restaurants in our area. Unfortunately, there's a real shortage of dry storage of boats in the area. And given its tremendous growth in recent years, this is much needed. It's nearly impossible to find a dry slip given the influx of people on, and limited waterfront space here. I believe the expansion of the facility as well as the aesthetic facelift would benefit our community greatly. I fully support the redevelopment of the Port 32 Marina that will add about 50 dry storage slips and be able to accommodate the lengths and heights of more modern boats rather than the current marina configuration that was designed decades ago. Project is long overdue and I have no doubt that this is going to be a great thing for both boaters and our broader community to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next we have Zach Salvatore and after that we have Alyssa Freeman. All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Zach Salvador. I live at 3826 Buttercup Circle South, um, and I have been sworn in. Uh, I was born and raised in Palm Beach Gardens. I've been here for over 33 years. Um, I've been an avid boater and fisherman um, since I can remember. Um, and like a lot of my neighbors in my area, we, uh, we keep a boat, um, my boat, on the side of the house. Um, it does give us convenient access to the water, which is great, but it also creates some nervousness uh, when hurricanes and large storms roll through. Um, that's why I am fully supportive of, uh, of uh, the Palm Beach Gardens uh, City approving the plans for the new PGA Marina um, that will ultimately potentially, well, one, add a hurricane-hardened building um, in order to store boats. Um, also, should we be in direct line of a, of a large storm, uh, Port 32 could potentially allow for even more boats to be stored inside. Um, and with that, I hope that you approve this project and give our boating community more options for storm safety. Thanks. Thank you so much. Next, we have Alyssa Freeman, and then our last card will be Noel Martinez. <coughs> Ms. Freeman, if you'd be so kind as to state your name, your address, and if you've been sworn in. Hello. Can somebody please swear me in? Our clerk will help you with that. Sorry. <laughs> do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Good evening. My name is Alyssa Freeman. I'm the executive director for the Marine Industries Association of Palm Beach County. I'm also a boater. Um, oh, our address is 1208 U.S. Highway 1 in North Palm Beach. So we're just, our office is just south of this project. Um, as Austin said, we represent all of the marine businesses and boaters here in Palm Beach County. Um, but we also own the Palm Beach International Boat Show. And a fun fact is that the very first Palm Beach Boat Show was right here in Palm Beach Gardens in 1982 at Sovereign Harbor Marina. So there is a very big history of boat big boating history here in Palm Beach Gardens. Um, we also put on the annual Palm Beach Holiday Boat Parade every year, so we, we love having um, the support and partnership of Palm Beach Gardens with that. Um, the industry has a huge economic impact. It's $4.7 billion, and that's uh, close to double what it was back in 2018. The population growth has been huge, as everybody knows. I mean, that's Everybody knows that. And with that, with, it, with all the amounts of people moving here, a lot of them are boaters. And so as everybody has mentioned, we need that access. It's so important. I'm for, I, like I said, I have a boat, but I'm fortunate enough to not live in an HOA. I can keep it um, in my driveway. But there's so many people that, that can't do that. And so um, if you were to call any place to have your boat dry stored somewhere, um, you're not going to be able to get in, most likely. I mean, there's, there's waiting lists. Or all of our members that I've talked to have waiting lists. So it's important to have it. And um, the amount that they're proposing, I think, it is wonderful to be able to have 57 more. Um, also, the industry employs 20,000 people here in Palm Beach, uh, in Palm Beach County. Um, and so we wholeheartedly support, support this project. Um, it's going to be uh, a real gem, I think, for the waterfront in Palm Beach Gardens. Um, it's going to be much safer than what we have right now. So again, we ask you to please support it, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. We have Noel Martinez, please. If you could come on up, state your name, your address, and if you've been sworn in. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, good evening, Noel Martinez, uh, 5520 PGA Boulevard, President and CEO of the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce, and I have been sworn in. I'm here tonight to express the Chamber's full support of the Port 32 project. We have had the privilege of thoroughly reviewing the proposal for the redevelopment of the marina. 
Um, the, pre we, the executive committee, it's been presented to our executive committee and our board of directors, and we find that this project not just not, is not in line with, but actually elevates the vision of Palm Beach North. The proposed architecture balances form and function, setting a high standard for quality, just like everything else the city of Palm Beach Gardens does. The planned access solutions for the Riverhouse Restaurant and the Harbor Financial Center are commendable. We all know that it's a mess going in and out of there. We've been doing it for years. These considerations help assure the safety of everyone involved, from patrons to business owners. $80 million, that's a significant investment in our community, which will have, which will have a ripple effect, greatly benefiting our businesses, not just in Palm Beach Gardens, but across the Palm Beach North region. This, this development's also gonna create jobs. According to the Florida scorecard, Palm Beach County needs to create almost 80,000 jobs by 2030. That's less than seven years away. This redevelopment is much needed. This marina is 50 years old. Palm Beach North has been a strong supporter of the city's marine district overlay. We find that this redevelopment to be consistent with that vision Therefore, our chamber not only endorses, but strongly urges the council to follow the PNZ and staff's recommendation to approve the, pre the PGA Marina redevelopment as proposed. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Noel. And on behalf of our whole council, thank you to everyone who spoke tonight for staying within time and to allow everyone the opportunity to speak and for your civil, respectful discourse. We're very, very thankful for that. So we're gonna allow opportunity for rebuttal. Do we have anyone who would like to come up, Mr. Tuma? Madam Mayor, I, I would just respond to your questions. It's getting later in the evening. Happy to respond to any questions the, the commission may have. Thank you. Then we'll go ahead and proceed. Um, in order to bring it back for discussion, I'm going to ask for a motion. I'm going to close the hearing, uh, get a motion in a second to approve, and bring it back for discussion. May I get a motion from my counsel, please? I'll make a motion to approve Resolution 58-2023. Thank you, Dana. All right. Thank you, Carl. Okay, guys. Let's dig, let's dig in, Carl. You want me to go, sir? Okay. It's up to you. I, I, saw, I, I suggest mm -hmm. sometimes on these big projects, we're all going to go back and forth a little bit. We might ask multiple questions from one council member to another, but we'll get where we need to be because I won't be ready for a little bit. Um, but the people who live in Palm Beach Gardens, we live here too. All of us do. And we don't roll into the city and be here for a year or two and get elected city council. There's probably over 200 and plus years between us five who live in Palm Beach Gardens. This isn't the first development or big development that has presented itself to us. We have the Twin Towers downtown at the gardens, what we're doing out west. Um, we make big choices and not one bolt gets laid into this city First off, without the scrutiny of our staff, um, and then without approval of the city council. So um, I'm going to lay it out right now because of how I feel about it, and this will probably set the course of how we're going to go. But um, I'm going to I'm going to support it, and I'm going to come back with some some uh, questions to staff and the developer developer but there's a vision of Palm Beach Gardens I myself the seven years I've been a council member it were technology based driven um, with a huge overlay of the community and what we're gonna do to not just Palm Beach Gardens but to the whole the whole northern Palm Beach County Palm Beach Gardens there's there's nothing like it around not Jupiter certainly not the cities to our south West Palm Palm Beach Gardens sets the pace in southern Florida, north of Broward, I mean, or, or even north of Miami. And if this development is done correctly, it's, it's going to be part of our DNA in, in you, know, you know, we're really not a marine community, I don't think, and I've been here a long time. But we are becoming, with our vision, of what we're doing on prosperity and, and so on. And with Catalfumo's project, 
we're getting more involved in the marina district and that little area around the pga bridge is very important to the vision of what we've got going on that marina is horrible it's been a mess since and the other the other i was here when we when they uh presented us that other thing that we were never going to approve um but just for starters that's how i'm going to set the pace i'm going to circle back to it i'm going to support it community needs it and it's it's a big picture but it won't be without some more questions that I have coming forward for uh, staff and uh, owner. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Carl. Dana? Um, yeah, I'll, st I'll start us off. Um, I just want to thank everyone who's here tonight. Um, everyone is really passionate about this project on both sides. We hear you. We hear you loud and clear. And it's been, um, this is something we have been, um, looking at for a long time as well um, and we've had a lot of questions in agenda review and we continue to have questions and, and I know that um, it, this might be the first time some people here have heard this but it's not the first time we have and we hear you loud and clear you're articulate you're professional you're passionate we're all passionate about Palm Beach Gardens and where we live and it's it's really evident um, I had a couple questions um, for Mr. Tuma and, and maybe Mr. Fitz, if I could. Um, I want to circle back on one of the waivers about the buffer on PGA Boulevard and you know why it's so condensed and if there's any issue with traffic and, and or just security with that buffer and things like that. So thank just you. some of these little details. Yes, Councilwoman, thank you for that. Um, the buffer along PJ Boulevard, it is narrow than what the code requirement. The code requirement is 20 feet. It goes from at a minimum point, I believe from 1.6 to 16. I'll put the graphic up to know for sure. But why that's like that is because there's water, sewer, phone lines across the intercoastal. But what we're doing is allowing it to be, uh, to increase the landscape in that area, particularly as you come over uh, the PGA Bowl, come over the uh, bridge, you'll notice there's additional landscaping. Some of it's even in potted plants because we can't plant because of the facilities that are there. So we've improved it. We have shifted that road, that existing road at the base of that bridge. It's moved over 50 feet to the west. That will help traffic. Mr. Hagen will, will agree with me on the access component. Also, on the main entrance, on that graphic you'll see with the, uh, how shall we say, the cajoling of your staff, we have created a, a significant amount of stacking before the first term. There's a proper ter there's a proper transportation terminology, which I can't think of right yet, but basically we've extended that so it meets the minimum requirement of the city. That doesn't exist today. So it allows for more vehicles to enter that driveway. Also, when you pull in, you don't have that quirky movement where you have to take that right turn into the river house. Now you get further in, then you go to the river house. So we believe that the access is much better than today than it was, than what, excuse me, much better when it, this will be built than it is today. And I hope, I hope I answered your question, Councilwoman. No, that was great, thank you. Um, one of the residents brought up policy and tiering. Can somebody um, answer that for me, the tiering question? Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> the policy in reference is uh, from Ordinance 3, 2022, when we uh, created the uh, Marina Overlay District. And the policy requires um, staff to craft an LDR amendment uh, within a year that includes these tiering policies. Those are not in place at this time. Um, however, we did, um, we looked at previous tiering policies that we have in the city as well to sort of look at that. I, I just want to clarify, um, well, Martin, is bringing up the exhibit because I think that an exhibit would help show you. Um, first of all, policy 1.3.10.1 is not applicable, period. That policy was specifically written for commercial uses against residential. So the proposed development is 
um, as you can see the zoning map in front of you, the entire adjacency of that northern boundary is commercial. So when it, the, the, so it's, it's not applicable, and I think you can end with a firm period there. However, the, and the map demonstrates that. However, as staff does implement this, because the comp plan policy was passed earlier this year, we would implement tiering standards. For reference, the tiering standards that have been included to date, which include the Workforce Housing Ordinance, which was passed by Council just a couple months ago, included some standards for tiering, as well as Alton, when the Brigger DRI, which Mr. Tuma also did back in the day, those standards. In that hypothetical scenario where we would introduce tiering standards, we would turn to similar tiering standards. And if you look at the distance from the existing building where the setback is on that north side is well over 100 feet, these tiering standards that are existing in our city's code are far exceeded. But the, 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 the firm and simple answer is it's not applicable. Okay, thank you, thanks. I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague because I'm sure we all have similar questions. We'll, we'll all come around a few times, Bert. Yeah, I'm gonna, real, I'm not a voter, so Ken, um, whoever the representative is for the operational side of this facility, I kinda wanna talk a little bit about when, if this facility is built, how do people come in, get the boat, what's the timing from you know, cycle building time. to, to, this, to the ground, how many can we do at a time? I want to know functionally how this operates. Sure, so. I can try a portion of that, but I'm going to ask Mr. Sure. Come on up. I kept calling him Mr. Schnell, and that was terrible. It's Mr. <laughs> I kept missing it, sorry. Uh, no, no worries, Ken. Um, so thank you for the question. Too, so uh, one of the rather simple innovations that we've made that wasn't possible until we all had smartphones, modern technology, is that we run a reservation system. Um, those reservations need to be made 24 hours in advance um, at the least. It's akin to making a tea time, um, but you make it on the Port 32 app on your phone. Um, those reservations are made on 10-minute um, increments, and we can allow two or three reservations uh, per 10-minute in increment, depending upon the settings that we choose for any particular marina. Um, so there's not an influx of traffic at any one time. There's not an influx of congestion, much like a golf course, because your reservations are metered out throughout the day, and those are made in advance. Um, to answer your question regarding um, the logistics of actually dropping a boat, um, that reservation system has a back end. That back end is an iPad that sits mounted on the forklift driver, um, so it presents a work queue. It's it's actually helped drive quite a bit of efficiency in our marine operations. So the forklift driver sees which reservation is up next, where the slip is located. He then drives to the slip, fetches the boat, drops it in the water where the dock hand takes it, um, fuels it if it, that's been requested, ice, drinks, and, and so on. It removes the friction for our members and from the community from actually getting out to enjoying the water with their family and their friends. They can just step on the boat and go. Um, that enables us to increase the throughput because you don't have people you know, waiting to load their coolers and ice the coolers and getting fuel. Um, we can, uh, really depending upon the travel distance of the lift between you know, the back wall of building C right. and the lift well or building B, around six to eight minutes per boat, and we can run two lifts at a time. Got it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the um, concerns over fuel within the two large buildings? I mean, I know your fuel pumps are going to be outside, located on the dock area. There are no fuel facilities with inside those two buildings to gas up boats? Uh, no, certainly not within the building. So, um, you know, th these buildings will be constructed to meet fire code, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, we've consulted with, uh, I believe, Fire Marshal Rosenberg, is that correct name? Um, we operate uh, almost 3,000 dry slips uh, around the state, um, including the, the 450 proposed here. Um, so fuel safety and, and, frankly, all safety is a big issue to us, and it, and it will be here. Um, you know, modern codes, which are, you know, not in place today, given the age of the facility, um, modern fire safety systems, um, they, they matter. Um, and, you know, that's, that's part of the reason for taking this antiquated facility and revitalizing it. And uh, tell me the size of the boats that are in these two facilities. Well, right now we have the larger boats are outside, frankly, because right. the infrastructure of the enclosed building is insufficient to fit the modern boater. Um, in 50 years, you can imagine there's been massive innovations in engine technology, which is propelling um, lighter and larger boats. Um, and, you know, in coastal Florida, where you do have access to the Atlantic Ocean, um, you know, sport fishermen um, and recreational boaters have the opportunity to 
you know, fight the waves out in the Atlantic in larger vessels. Um, right now, we accommodate those by putting them on the outdoor racks where we have space for them. Um, you know, this building will have spots on the lower racks for larger boats. Um, although, you know, the higher you go, you're constrained by, by essentially forklift weight capacity. So what size would be the biggest boat in these, in uh, one of these I buildings? I believe on the ground floor, yep. um, the largest boats will be 50 to 55 feet. Okay. Um, I can get the specifics by looking at the plan. And the smallest boat would be 20, 25, 30? I mean, I'm not... Well, there's, there's no limit on how small, okay. um, effectively, on the top racks. Um, the, it really is a matter of weight more than length. Gotcha. Um, okay. Appreciate that. Makes sense. Hours of operation during the weekday and weekends? Sure. We're seven days a week, eight to five. Sorry. Oh, you're doing great. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Se seven days a week, eight to five. <laughs> eight to five, seven mm -hmm. days a week. And, and the last question I had is with regards to fire. I mean, I know this facility, um, you know, I worry about turnaround and roundabouts and the, and the spacing and all that that we require for these larger fire apparatuses, we have to get somebody in there. So I'm curious about how everything is kind of laid out, if it, if it works for us without issue. It does. The fire marshal has had an opportunity to go ahead and look at access for us. Uh, he has worked out any issues that they had. We're good to go. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. That's all I have. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Marcy. I guess uh, going forth, uh, you guys have... Uh, answered a lot of my questions, so I appreciate that. And I do want to start by thanking you all for coming out here and voicing your concerns. It's not something uh, that we hear a lot. We, we a lot of times, have an empty uh, uh, council chamber, so we really appreciate that, and we do hear you, and I do concur with what Dana said. Um, I do have a, que a few questions, maybe for staff. Um, I heard something about uh, hardship with the waivers. Does a waiver require hardship or is that a variance? And the difference then? Yes, you are correct, ma'am. The uh, hardship reference is completely different. What is on the table, what is being requested by the applicant is a waiver. A waiver is an entirely separate process than a variance. A variance has a very different criteria where a, a hardship is required to be established. A waiver is very different. There's established criteria that has been adopted in our code that requires applicants to substantiate each and every waiver by providing additional elements of the project above and beyond code. Three clear examples would be enhanced architecture. Another example, sustainability, environmental enhancements for the site. Another example, enhanced landscaping and open space. So there's, there's actually a set criteria. So when these waivers were submitted and were carefully evaluated by staff, the waiver was um, considered and reviewed and supported based on the additional um, enhancements that the applicant has provided, which are consistent with the city's code. And then uh, since you're already speaking, I'm going to ask you another question, which is in regards to uh, recent legislation that was just passed, which I personally hate. But um, this is an industrial site or a uh, commercial site, um, industrial use, I guess you would say. Um, if Live Local, uh, which was just recently passed, were in place, which means that somebody can come here and redevelop this site, um, without coming to council approval, what would be the um, height uh, um, requirements or the height that they can ask for st at a staff level? Yes, well, or do they have to even ask that? If they are yeah, entitled uh, to, I guess you would say. Right, so Senate Bill 102, otherwise known as Live Local, was a, um, a statewide omnibus bill that provided a ton of preemption for, um, for zoning. And one of the key things that it does when a developer, com developer comes forward and commits 40% um, workforce housing is it eliminates the public process. It eliminates city council's right to be able to approve publicly a, a development. So Live Local has some frustrating elements. There's a lot of ambiguity to it, um, but I can say with certainty that the allowable height for this particular site is 90 feet, clearly. That's established in the comprehensive plan. So under Live Local, um, a workforce housing project, uh, and it has to be mixed use, so some kind of mixed use workforce housing project could go up to 90 feet without city council approval process. 
And I know uh, one of my questions was actually in regards to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection's um, clean marina designation. Is that something that is required or the applicant is planning to apply for now that it's being redeveloped? Whoever wants to answer it. Sure. Um, it was in regards to the Florida Department um, of Environmental Protection's uh, clean marina designation. Is that something that's required now that it's being redeveloped to apply for, or is it something that you're planning to apply for, which would be a great designation to have, obviously? Yes, thank you. Um, it is not a requirement, but we uh, are planning and we'll have the clean marina designation. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, too, have lived here since the 80s, um, and uh, I do recall this site. I remember when the landmark was uh, coming here for approval. To the, I wasn't on the council at the time, but I remember that uh, very, very well because I lived in the general area, and it, it was a very tough thing. So I, I do absolutely appreciate all of your comments and all of your concerns. Um, you are doing a great job with the access um, for the River House. To me, it was a very unsafe, yes, it was improved a little bit um, not that long ago, but it's still a very unsafe way to get to a very, very, very busy uh, commercial uh, restaurant establishment, so I do appreciate that. Um, I have re received over 60, and I didn't ex parte that, but I did receive over 60 emails um, for and against both uh, in regards to this petition. And a couple that resonated with me were um, in regards to the limited availability of storage, of boat storage. And um, so I actually did do some calling around like I typically do, and it's true. The, um, the amount of storage slips um, has decreased, especially in the north end. Um, in addition, the um, indoor uh, boat storage uh, is something that's uh, limited. Um, so I understand uh, the need here. But um, with all of that said, you've answered all of my questions. Um, and I appreciate all of you guys being here and the time that you've said. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Marcy. Carl, we're going to come back down to you again. All right. Well, I have a few more questions. How many people are we expecting to come and go out of this parking lot every day on a, once it's built? Uh, good evening, for the record. Uh, Chris Hagen, I'm a tra transportation engineer with Kimley Horn Associates at 477 South Rosemary Avenue in West Palm Beach, and I was sworn in at the beginning of the hearing. Um, the traffic study that we prepared uh, was actually a little tougher than, than you know, kind of your standard run-of-the-mill uh, traffic analysis because there are some, uh, some different uses here that don't have established ITE rates. So we, we ended up erring on the side of, of being conservative. For the uh, boat showroom and boat sales component of it, there is no uh, really accepted or, or published trip generation rate for that. So we used automobile sales which is a, certainly a higher, uh, there's a higher amount of traffic that comes to an auto showroom than there is to a boat showroom over the, the course of the day. Uh, but with that, uh, based on the analysis that we conducted uh, in adding the additional marina slips, uh, we were projecting approximately 26 additional AM peak hour trips and 41 additional PM peak hour trips above and beyond what is coming in and out of those driveways today. So less than a, a one additional trip every minute, less than that. So what's the total? The total in the AM peak hour is, uh, is 61, and in the PM peak hour, 136. Is that current? No, it's, uh, that's, that's okay. in the future with the redevelopment. And the, the, other, tricky, the other tricky thing is that the uh, driveway to the west is actually a shared driveway, so there are higher volumes going in and out of there. Point that are going to both River House and also to the harbor side, uh, to the west. So Marina specifically, right. buck and a half, mm -hmm. somewhere Correct. during the day. How many employees do we have currently, and how much, what's our projected employee when you get built out? Okay. 
currently uh, vice mayor, there are eight employees, and in the future, there'll be 12. That's it? Good. Wow, that's great. It's probably going to be AI driving the forklifts one day. Okay, so don't, um, don't go anywhere. <laughs> We've had this conversation in the past with building other developments, the one over off of North Lake Boulevard. Um, if we're going to have 150 people coming and going and 12 whatever employees, maybe more or less, how come only two charging stations? Or is it more than two? Because I'm going to, we're going to want, this is where we bargain. So, and what's the, what kind of charging stations are those? You know, our friend Rochelle's not here anymore, so, but it's a great question. So, how many charging stations? We have, okay, I always mess this up. Two cars can be charged at one time. How does that sound? With two charging stations, so four cars at once. No, two cars, one station. So how many charges, cars can be charged at one time? Two. So then why do we only have, why don't we have more with 150? Well, there are two stations, two stations, two stations, four cars. It's still not enough. Okay, that, uh, well, well, I don't necessarily know if that's right, but um, we're going to pull out the plans and look real quick. Let's it's get the to way of the future, and everybody going in there is going to have a, 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 a battery-operated car if they can afford a half-a-million-dollar boat on up. Yeah, I know, but we've been pushing it. It's green. What's that? Oh, there's two. One. It's here, and it's located between these two parking spaces. Okay. What do you see that? Okay, I, I can't see the plants, to be honest with you. i got to get a little bigger print. But to answer your question is, I suspect, Mr. Woods, you'd like a, an additional uh, charging station. I want as many as we can get in there because <laughs> it's going to be growing. How many can we get? Um, I think that I need to caucus real quick with the person who's writing the check. Uh, but to answer your question is we certainly can get more. Um, you have, let me. Let's make the choice now. Well, with a lot, lot, lots of uh, debating going on. Mr. Well, Williams, I'm getting my support from my council members, too. I, I, I so which fight you want? What? Well, I know what the one I don't want. So I know answer, you don't. The answer is uh, we would be willing to provide three, which equates to six spots. There's a great location for those. It works on the transformer. We have to work through the details where the transformer goes, but that, that's what fits generally in that area. I like six. My council likes three six. Three chargers, total of six. I dig that. What speed? What speed are the chargers? What, yeah. What level? Don't put the lazy oh. ones in. Two. Two Thank for you. sure. Thank two. you, Mr. Price. All right. Got okay. it. I'm not. Hold on, Mayor. In one of the presentation slides, a um, couple of us discussed it, and I've drove over that bridge a billion times. There's power poles along the sidewalk. Are they currently there? They are. Yes, sir. With everything that's going on, is there a way we can put it's those underground? impossible to put those underground. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and Natalie, remember a couple years when Seacoast was putting in their new building and the aisles was screaming that they weren't had notification. We didn't get with their association. How did we, the city, the city do with our exposure or letting these people know that it was coming and what, how did we do for notification on this project? I'm trying to remember the the specifics from, from Seacoast um, on that particular matter. This is what I can say with certainty that um, you know, this, this petition has met all notice requirements. And so there, there have clearly, you know, although clearly some residents may not feel like there has been enough, there's certainly been meetings, there has been communications, we have received communications, we have received notice of meetings. That's not required pursuant to our code. That's 
above and beyond our code that the developer has initiated outreach in addition to the outreach and the presentations made with other organizations such as the chamber and the corridor association it's not required it's good practice it's not required um, but in terms of meeting all public notice requirements have been fully met for this petition including the planning zoning petition where uh, mailers were sent out to all affected property owners within a 500 foot radius and, and then of course this public hearing this evening that had the that had a uh, site posted full page ad and um, notices mailed okay well I mean I know we get ingrained in a lot of projects and I, like the other council members, got 60 emails, various support and against today. So I never had the opportunity of meeting any of the community because no one let me know for or against. And my last question, this is considered a new build, correct? So does art come into play here? So this, this, this is where I get on my high horse because this isn't under my umbrella. I'm gonna look at the owner and Mr. Matheson and say, we don't want your money, we want art. So you guys gonna tell me you're gonna do art there? Yes, sir? Okay, then I'll let the AIPP board do their thing then, as long as I got your word. Yes? The applicant has most definitely made the clear commitment that, uh, that, a, that a portion, a good portion of their art is going to be made with public art through the fulfillment of the city's artistic bus shelter. Um, and then as to how they meet the rest of it, um, that, that is dictated by code. You know, they do, pursuant to code, they do have that option to, to pay or they could do art. They do have that choice. And so that is still open. Um, well, we still shake hands here. So I, we don't want your money. We want you guys to do art. Okay, Steve? Okay. Okay, that's all I need to do here. Thank you. All right, thank you, Carl. Mercy, I think you have one more question. Uh, or a couple? Actually, two. Yep. One is, what is the construction schedule, the timeline, if you can walk us through that a little bit? So, uh, we, uh, this is a, a, a new building, a new design. There's a significant amount of permitting that has to go on, obviously, through the fire department, the building department, the actual design. But once that's done, we expect the construction to be about approximately 18 months. Okay. Okay, got it. And then um, one thing, because I forgot to turn my page over, I kept writing notes as we were going. I noticed on the graphic with the buffer to the north, um, there is obviously the sable palms that are thick and existing and large, and then you have a cocoa plum hedge, which is gonna be perfect for the hedge requirement. Is it possible to do something um, in the middle? Um, so if you're looking from the sable palms to the hedge, just to fill in that, is it possible to pepper in some thatch palms so that uh, it can help that area between the two to block the parking lot and that whole other area? I, I feel like I should sit down quick because we're getting a lot of, but to answer your question, there, there is room for triple trunk Florida thatches, or a triple trunk Florida thatch. Right. to allow for some more view in that middle corridor, three foot clear trunk to allow for an overall height uh, to be able to do that. I think I did walk that buffer today just because I knew this question potentially could come up about what we could do. It's a narrow buffer, but we do have the opportunity to put probably 20 to 25, but we'd have to work with staff and for the permitting to be able to put those triple trunk Florida thatch palms in there. And Natalie, is that possible for them to do during the permitting process? Absolutely, okay. those minor adjustments and additional uh, enhancements can be addressed at the permitting level. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. All set, Marcy? Yes. Okay, lovely. Bert? Um, no, I just wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's never an easy decision uh, for us to make when it involves height, which this seems to be the primary issue on this building. As I read through the report, read through the presentations, listened to everything tonight, I mean, I look at all the positives on this building with the exception of height, with the access point, access point correction, with the river house, the adjacent properties, which has always been a concern. Uh, there's no overnight boarding on this facility. The hurricane rated buildings on that corner now, in terms of no boat building or manufacturing on the site as well, 
Um, pretty much all operations are going to be done internally within the buildings. I haven't known of any environmental issues really on that site, and now we're correcting runoff with this new construction. Um, and no building permits are going to be issued until all state, local, fed agencies, everything's been done according to plan. So for me, it's, it's a project I would support. Um, I realize that the height argument will go on now and forever on other projects because that's what we have to deal with. But we try to concentrate height in certain areas within our city. Um, and I feel like this is probably an area that can, can deal with the height. So all these positive mitigants, getting rid of that crappy building that's there now and putting a pretty first-class marina in there with um, additional customer base uh, that either live or don't live in the city and utilize that waterway and all the restaurants up and down our corridor within our city. Um, I'm supportive of the project, so I just wanted to let everybody know. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and bring it to vote. We don't hear any further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Moving along to Resolution 56, 2023, if the clerk could please read the title. 59. 59. I apologize. 59. Reading glasses. 59. Yes. Resolution 59, 2023. Sure. Resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach. Hold up, Patty, please. <laughs> Folks, if you're going to exit, please do so quietly. We have more meeting to go. That means please exit without speaking. Go ahead. Resolution 59, 2023, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving a major conditional use to allow a bar use for Tommy Bahama Marlin Bar Restaurant within the Gardens Mall, the subject site being generally located north of PGA Boulevard, east of Fairchild Gardens Avenue, south of Gardens Parkway, and west of Kew Gardens Avenue, as more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to open the hearing, and we're going to declare ex parte again. I'll start over here on my right with Marcy. Do you have ex parte regarding Resolution 59? I do not. For it? None for me. Tana? Nope. And Carl? Uh, ex parte? None? All right, and I have none myself. We have a petitioner presentation. We have Mr. Martin Holland from L.D. Reeves & Associates. Good morning. Or good evening. Feels like morning. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> good evening. My name is Martin Holland. I am with L.D. Reeves representing Tommy Bahama and Tommy Bahama Marlin Bar. I have been sworn in, and thank you very much for your time and staff working with us uh, over the months that we've been working on this. Just to give a, a quick... Um, after I'm not sure what time it is at the moment, but a, a lot quicker. Tommy Bahama, our history is over 30 years, island lifestyle, island themed. One of the things that has been um, important to Tommy Bahama is also the adaptability. And one of the things that they've also learned by having the retail stores, they're also the restaurants, is also doing a combination of those. So having the ability for you to be able to go to dinner or have a cocktail or go shopping is now all in one particular area. One of the things that we're very proud about is that Palm Beach Gardens is one of the first of uh, a half dozen that we've worked uh, through the state, but in the, in the southeast of Florida. So that is, we're very proud of that. We also have um, hired an in excess of 70 people for our, 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 our branding. And one of the things that we do is that your retail side may be your wait staff side one night or vice versa bar stays the same because of the alcohol beverage licensing. One of the things is trying to um, adapt and develop the area that we did. This is something that was approved uh, in February of 22 by the Forbes Cor Corporation in the mall itself to allow uh, the patio to be designed and built into the, the mall. This took over an area that was a fountain with heavily landscaped. Uh, that fountain has been relocated. We've planted additional landscaping around the area and hope that, well, it won't be a hope, it will as it grows, as everything grows in Florida. 
will be very, very beautiful by this time next year, pending any more storms and hurricanes. Um, one of the things that does, I believe, throw someone off is the term bar. We're, 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 we're not a bar nightclub. We're a bar for you to be able to come in, relax, like you're in an island theme, enjoy yourselves, enjoy the company of some mute live music. Also, if you want to shop, you can shop. One of the things we are doing right now, we currently are working under the Florida uh, statute of alcohol beverage, which is an SFS, special food service, which limits us to 51% food and non-alcoholic beverages. We have had to modify our menu somewhat to be able to keep that classification. Our petition to come to you for this major conditional use is to allow us to be able to go beyond that 51% or go below that 51% so that we could operate how we would like to operate. And that, again, we're not a nightclub. One of the things that we open Sunday through Thursday, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. Friday, Saturday is 11 a.m. <clears throat> to 10 p.m. The retail store has slightly different hours. We actually have the means of closing off and separating retail from the bar and, and dining area. We also have the means of being able to secure the store, retail, and independently from the mall and have worked out the security plan within the mall and how when the mall closes, we can still stay operational but we are able to keep the, the mall, the rest of the mall safe. Wanted to, so that you have an idea of where we're at, just on the other side of Saks Fifth Avenue, there on that northwest corner. A little bit more closer up of the development of the, the patio area. And now just, I believe pictures speak more than I can. This is what we started with. And this is what was approved through the administrative uh, process. Also through the, the building permit and planning and zoning. And um, as you can tell, the landscaping will mature and will be brighter. This is a little bit closer up, so you can have an idea of our sunshades, our louvered. These shades, the gray that you can see, they're about halfway down. Those are operated by motor, by remote control, and those can be dropped or raised. You can see that the fountain is there. Additional seating has been put off up closer inside. This is when you walk in the, the mall entrance and you turn to your left, this is what you see. I don't believe you see a nightclub bar. I, you can see roughly 10 to 12 feet is the bar. You order at the bar. You walk in, order, or you walk in and go to your left and go to the showroom. This is, as you can see, the picture there on the left We've taken a picture of just down into the bar that also with the patio in the background. The other picture is from the other end of the bar looking into and the area of the retail space. Once again, our bar area is not very large. Here is a panoramic view of roughly about 20 feet into the retail area just so that you get an idea of how much larger the showroom is versus the bar and restaurant patio. Our patio, we're very proud of it. We're, we love this design, and we love this design for several different reasons. One, the protection. Yes, the roof is louvered. Those louvers are mechanical. Those louvers can be shut completely and the rain still drains off and you're not getting wet. The 
I'm sorry? Okay. No, I'd say keep going. That's okay. fantastic. I'm just, I haven't been there yet, so I'm okay. loving what you're saying. One of the things that's also because um, South East Florida, temperatures, humidity, the white instruments that you see that look like where ceiling fans would go are air generation fans internals with misters. So those actually condition the air and, and to make it uh, even more comfortable to be there. I'll point out to the lower right hand corner is our live music. Live music, we've applied and been granted our permit for live music. And um, those, I, I, I'll expand on that amount of time. Monday through Thursday, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Fridays and Saturdays, 5 to 9 p.m. And Sundays, 12 to 4. We're very conscientious about being able to have a conversation. Go back to, we want you to be able to relax. We don't want to blare out. We know that during those hours, we're limited to 65 decibels during the day and 60 at night. This amp that's sitting there is just for to cover that area. The musician is able to plug into our house system, which has speakers throughout, and that is blessed, excuse me, cast it over so that you can still carry on a conversation and not have it spill out into the walkway. Here is a panoramic, more of the outdoor area. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out, the couple here on the left had just asked for the blinds to be lowered and that was happening. They asked for the top to be closed because they didn't want any more sun on top of them where the others are still open. Our team wants to thank you very much for your consideration. I'm Excellent. here to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Any, any questions, Council? I just have one count, uh, question on security. So we know the mall has security all around at different hours of the night. Are you paying for additional security or paying to the mall to keep oh. people there past the 10 o'clock hour as they depart? No, we, 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 we do not because one of the things that has happens with the mall is that when our retail store closes mm -hmm. and the mall closes, the mall security creates a, a ballard system across so that there's no more pedestrian traffic that can, they can still exit our entry door, but outside. There's nothing, and before. Like on the weekends, you close at on, nine on the, the store. And the, yeah, and, the, and the, our, man, our management team yeah. also in, identifies to the patrons, the mall is closing in 30 minutes. Right. This is what you have to do. And right. that is leave through the patio or leave through the main entrance and immediately out the mall door. So there's no pedestrian traffic to go into the into mall. The mall. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Okay, uh, Marcy. So with that said, is the retail component of the um, restaurant bar closed then when the mall closes? Yes. Or yes, okay. That's it, thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? A couple of us did go do our due diligence this weekend to check out the facility. So, um, why don't you invite us? I, we went separately. Ironically oh. enough, we we both checked it out. I went oh. Saturday. Marcy went Sunday. Sunday. And um, indeed, I think we spent more on alcohol than food. So this is part of what brought you here. Um, no, uh, any? We don't have any other comments. Anything else? All right. So uh, let's go ahead and close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second? Please. I'll make a motion to approve Resolution 59-2023. Second. All right. Thanks you. Thank you both. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, Sarah. All right, guys. We're going to move on to Resolution 51-2023. If the clerk could please read the title. Resolution 51-2023, Resolution Resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of regular and alternate members to the Art and Public Places Advisory um, Board, providing an effective yeah. date for other purposes. Oh. Thank you so much, Patty. So we have no comment cards on this, and let's just go right into council discussion. If uh, 
if you guys want to discuss it or make a motion as you wish. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 51-2023 with the recommendation to reappoint Eric Jablin, James Garvin, Gail Kobage, Jennifer O'Brien, and appoint Edward Penza as a regular member and appoint Muriel Bryan as an alternate member. Second. All right. Um, any other further discussion or changes? Can I get a motion and a second? I did that. Yeah. Sorry. Long night. I apologize. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes for resolution 51. Moving on to resolution 52. This is our appointments to the Parks and Recreation Board. Patty, if you could read the title, please. Resolution 52, 2023, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of regular and alternate members to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much. We um, do want to discuss this. We don't have any comment cards. Then I am going to ask for a motion to approve resolution 50, I'm sorry, 52 with the recommendation to reappoint Jason Morales, Nicholas Russo, Matthew, um, thank you, um, Zudans, Keith Ehrenheim, Matthew Kamula, and appoint Faith Meyer as regular members and appoint Ron McEl McElhone as first alternate and Shannon Zimmerman as second alternate. If I could get a motion and a second. I'll make that motion. Sharon. No. Exactly what you said on Resolution 52 2023. Make a second. <laughs> all right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. We'll move on to re uh, Resolution 53. If the clerk could please read the title. Resolution 53 2023, Resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of regular and alternate members to the Planning, Zoning, and Appeals Board, providing an effective date for the purposes. Okay. So I'm going to look for a motion to approve Resolution 53 2023 with the recommendation to reappoint Robert Savell, uh, Zachary Seth Mansfield, and appoint Linda Hess as regular members, and appoint Nadia Spivak as first alternate, and Alana Cooper as second alternate. Make the motion resolution 53-2023, as you just said it. I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. So last is resolution 54, please. Um, Fire Pension Board. Patty, if you'd read the title. 50, resolution 54-2023, resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of regular members to the City of Palm Beach Gardens Firefighters Pension Board, providing an effective date and vote purposes. All right, so thank you so much, Patty. I'm seeking a motion to approve Resolution 54, 2023, with a recommendation to reappoint Thomas Topor and appoint Lisa Lalonde, as Eric Bruns is no longer seeking a reappointment. I'll make the res the, uh, I forgot already, I'm tired. You want a motion? I'll make the motion to <laughs> approve Resolution 54, 2023, as I'll said. I'll second. Second, any further discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Do we have any items for council action or discussion or interest? I don't. Do we have a city attorney's report? I, wait, wait, I, oh, yeah. I do just want to say one thing very, very quickly, um, and I just want to publicly thank um, Barbara Haynes for her um, many oh, years yes. of service, a.k.a. Santa Claus, Mrs. Claus, oh. and uh, just congratulate her. On, I know she's not here. It's been a long night on her retirement. I just wanted to publicly say that we really, really appreciate all of her dedication she's um, a good one. through her tenure serving with the city of Palm Beach Gardens. Thank you, Marcy. That is extremely important, and I know those who have worked with her would definitely agree with that. Max, do we have a city attorney report tonight? I have a brief two-hour PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Uh, no, ma'am. Order pizza. Oh my God. All right. Thank you. There's no other business. This meeting is adjourned, and I'm going to run for the